science is interesting, and if you don't agree, you can fuck off. Welcome to the Darwin Digest, episode 49. This week we are discussing Samites. I am joined, as per usual, by my co-hosts, Lawrence Drake. Hello. And Kathy Princess. Hello. All right, so it uh, sounds like we've got quite a lot this episode, so um, I guess we will jump straight into it. Uh, today I'm discussing uh, a tale of two migrations, I guess you could say. Uh, these are both by a single Y chromosome haplogroup. Uh, J1. Uh, these migrations occurred well apart and really they've got little to do with each other other than who migrated of course but they're both kind of interesting so I wanted to talk about them. As a quick note the first half of this I will be referring to the J series of haplogroups, groups specifically J's two main subgroups uh, JM62 and JM172. These are also both known as EU10 and EU9 respectively. Basically, it's a nomenclature thing. And things are actually a little bit more complicated than that because the former two are actually subsets of the respective latter two. Um, like I said, it's just nomenclature and it's a bit all over the place. But for the purposes of today, basically, JM62 is EU10 and uh, JM172 is equivalent to EU EU9. It's close enough. <laughs> um, and it'll work for us fine. Anyway, Jackie's uh, Shironi writes... Uh, et al. Write, it writes in the emergence of Y chromosome haplogroup J1E among Arabic speaking populations, published 2010 in the European Journal of Genetics. Uh, he is writing about essentially the uh, the spread of uh, the people who would become Arabs from uh, the Fertile Crescent into Arabia, and uh, you know it's kind of something that should be mostly obvious. It should be kind of self-evident that. It, that it happened, there were lots of there were lots of people who spread out from the Fertile Crescent, but you know th this is the evidence for it. And so he writes, uh, tracing the origin and expansion of pastoral nomadism in the Middle East has uh, has had widespread significance for understanding the development of the civilizations of the ancient Near East and the spread of the Semitic languages throughout the uh, Levant, the Arabian Peninsula, and Mesopotamia. Why chromosome analysis of modern populations in the Middle East? Uh, can contribute to the delineation of the demographic and migration processes in the region, the predominant categories of Y chromosomes in the region, uh, varieties of uh, varieties associated with haplogroup JM304. Uh, this haplogroup uh, essentially bifurcates into two main subclades, J1267 and J2M172. Uh, studies of J1M267 have found that it occurs in high frequencies among Arab, Arabic-speaking populations of the Middle East, conventionally interpreted as reflecting the, reflecting the spread of Islam in the first millennium AD. Uh, however, before the middle of the first millennium AD, a variety of Semitic languages were spoken throughout the Middle East. Recently, historical linguists have constructed uh, novel classification trees of the Semitic languages in which uh, the first split from the roots of Proto-Semitic separated into East Semitic, uh, Akkadian, Assyrian, Babylonian, and Ebalite, and West Semitic. West Semitic then partitions into Ethiopic, modern South Arabian, uh, as spoken in areas of Oman and Yemen, and the core cluster of Central Semitic. Central Semitic uh, would then include the languages of Yemen, um, Old South Arabian, um, Arabic, and the Northwest Semitic languages of the uh, Ugaritic, Hebrew, Phoenician, and Aramaic. Not only have linguists reconstructed the phylogeny of Semitic languages, they've also dated Proto-Semitic ages to the uh, Calocythic uh, era, circa 5,500 to 3,500 BC. In addition to the common Semitic language substrate found throughout the Lebanon and Arabian Peninsula, recent archaeological studies have shown an early presence uh, circa 6,000, 7,000 BC uh, of domesticated herding in the aerial, uh, the aerial steppe desert regions. A 2008 study showed an inverse correlation between J1 M26 frequency and mean annual rainfall in Middle Eastern populations. Uh, 
the finding was interpreted as a founder effect associated with a small group of with small groups of Nithalitic, uh herder hunters moving into the arid regions of the Arabian Peninsula with a, a pastoral economy, whereas other ancestral populations with a closely associated sister clade, J two A M four ten, remained mainly in the regions of the Fertile Crescent that had sufficient rainfall to support a Neolithic farming economy. Although humidity levels fluctuated during the Holocene, the present climactic regime in Arabia was established about 5,000 years ago. Marginal habitats such as desert regions uh, that were plausibly colonised by a few founders resulted in not only reduced genetic diversity, but also reduced linguistic diversity as evidenced by the broad geographical footprint of the Arabic language and the arid regions of the Middle East. Although considerable sub-haplogroup diversification has previously been described within the J2M172 clade, the occurrence of J1M267-affiliated subtypes at frequencies exceeding a few percentage has not yet been reported. Uh, So this study is then presenting a uh, uh, phylogeographical and haplotype diversity data series from these major subclades. The, the, the study um, basically goes on to, uh, supports the hypothesis that the origin is more likely in the more northerly populations, um, and then it spreads southward in the Arabian Peninsula. The high YSTR, uh, YSTR is essentially Y chromosome short tandem uh, repeat. Just think sort of like a marker you can use to trace genetic history. Uh, anyway, the YS, high YSTR variants of J1E in Turks and Syrians support the inference of an origin of J1E in nearby eastern Anatolia. Uh, moreover, a network analysis of J1E haplotypes showed that some of the populations with low diversity, such as the Beowidins from Israel, Qatar, Sudan, and the UAE, are tightly clustered with near-high frequency haplotypes, suggesting founder effects with a, sort of like a starburst expansion in the Arabian desert. These series of expansion times is also consistent with subsequent Neolithic range expansion of uh, J1E from a geographical zone including northeast Syria, northern Iraq and eastern Turkey towards uh, Mediterranean Anatolia, uh, Ismaili from southern Syria, southern Syria, uh, Jordan, Palestine and northern Egypt. Although there is a trend between the mean variables and the expansion time estimates, um, the latter do not uniformly increase with variance as some of the populations are more likely to have more than one J1E founder. Uh, support for this expansion involves cases where there is a presence of two distinct, two distinct, distinct varieties of YCA11 chromosomes, uh, namely 1922 and 2222, uh, whereas the those with low mean diversity typically just reflect the 2222 class. Um, a network analysis of J1E chromosomes also reflects uh, situations with multiple founders. Although haplogroup diversification with J1E remains incomplete, uh, the somewhat rare uh, J1E1 M368 provides an insight into geographical origins of J1E. Uh, it's been reported that both in the Black, Re- uh, Black Sea region of Turkey and Dagestan in the Northeast Caucasus. Uh, furthermore, J1E1 M368 displays the YCA2-1922 pattern Although the haplogroup relationships of the YCA2 alleles are unstable, nevertheless, in the context of haplogroup J1, they are suggestive that the prevalent YCA2-2222 variety may have evolved from the YCA2-1922 ancestor. So what does that all mean? That's a big word salad. Um, there's a summary in the article, which I'll go, I'll, I'll go through and describe uh, after I've read it. It's actually quite a lot of, it, quite a lot of summary. Uh, the timing and geographical distribution of J1E is representative of a demic expansion. Uh, demic expansion is essentially like a, the initial expansion of a population group. It can be into it can be into an area where there is no population, or into an area where there's a bit of population. It doesn't really matter. It's just the initial expansion of a particular group. The demic expansion of agriculturalists and uh, herder hunters from the pre-pottery Neolithic B into the late Neolithic area. The higher variants observed in Oman, Yemen, and Ethiopia suggest sampling variability and or demographic complexity associated with multiple founders and multiple migrations. Uh, the expansion time associated with Yemen is somewhat older, uh, about 7000 BC, and may reflect a migration of herders into southern Arabia. Uh, finally, more recent expansion times observed in Arabs from the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Negev, Bedouins, and Sunni Arabs from Hama, 
um, Syria are consistent with a uh, subsequent Paleolithic um, Bronze Age, so 3000 to 5000 BC, advance of J1E into the Arab population from Arabia, from nearby early attested Arabian speaking uh, Tamay in northern Central Arabia. Although most post last glacial maximum recolonization, uh, if you remember a couple of episodes back, I uh, discussed the last glacial maximum in terms of Europe, uh, same last glacial maximum. Although most post-last glacial maximum recolonization events have a typically northward signature, our J1E results provide an example of a southward, uh, southward spreading during the early Holocene. Although J1E is one of the most frequent haplogroups in the region, uh, haplogroup EM123 also shows high, its highest frequency in haplotype diversity in regions of the Fertile Crescent, decreasing towards the Arabian Peninsula. This co-distribution pattern of Y-chromosome haplogroups, J1E and EM123, resembles uh, mitochondrial DNA haplogroups, J1B and uh, pre-HV. Uh, one dis distributions that also display low levels of diversity despite their high frequency in Saudi Arabia. Uh, although on a broad scale, haplogroup uh, J1E frequency and distribution and expansion times are consistent with the mode uh, that it tracks a possible expansion of Neolithic uh, agropastoralists from the Fertile Crescent into the arid Arabian Peninsula. Seven caveats. Um, there, there, like, there are a few issues with this. Uh, first, like the patchy distributions of J1E uh, across the Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Israel, and Palestine um, affect the and, and sort of uh, they they reflect the complex demographic dynamics of of ethnicity and religion, even to a degree, in the region and. Uh, uh, the high YSTR variants of J1E lineages in eastern Anatolia, northern Iraq, northwestern Iran. You can't really rule out recent admixture as a significant contributor to the high variance among ethnic Assyrians. A recent um, Bayesian analysis of the Semitic languages also supports the Lebanon as sort of being in origin about 5,750 years ago. That's uh, the earliest point we've got a divergence in the language. And subsequent arrival in the Horn of Africa from Arabia 2,800 years ago. This, you know, this is sort of indirect support for the um, phylogenetic clock that they had proposed above. Yeah, so again, that's even more complicated. To put it very simple, during the Neolithic period around about, uh, what would that be for us? For them, it was what, it's eight, uh, six to 8,000 years ago, something like that. <laughs> phrase it really simply, the people we now know as Arabs migrated into Arabia from the Fertile Crescent. And th essentially, this is a big confirmation of their Semitic origins. It's really obvious um, and fairly simple. There's, there's not really much to discuss there, but it's just this: we have this we have this strong evidence of a migration from the Fertile Crescent into Arabia. What I found really interesting when just sort of looking up stuff for the study is we have the exact same haplogroup group undergoing a uh, we could say a more recent. Um, but by more recent, you know, the birth of Islam migration. And this second migration, uh, I'll be reading from a letter to the editor, editor by um, Almut Al Nibble uh, et al. It's uh, named Genetic Evidence for the Expansion of Arabian Tribes into the Southern uh, Lebanon and North Africa, published 2002 in the American Journal of Human Genetics. The letter is a um, response to a 2001 paper regarding the portion of Arab DNA found in modern Spain. Uh, hint, it was very little. Uh, the letter doesn't really, it doesn't really attack, or it's got nothing to do with the premise of the paper no, that it's really responding to. Rather, it's uh, making a small correction in regards to the historical background and uh, that the original work tries to sort of give. But it, so it's not a negation of the paper, but it's, it gives a really good description of exactly the sort of thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, so anyway, in a recent publication, Borsch et al. 2001 reported on Y chromosome variation in populations from northwestern Africa and the Iberian Peninsula. They observed a high degree of genetic homogeneity but among the northwestern African Y chromosomes of Moroccan Arabs, Moroccan Berbers, and uh, Saharawis, uh, leading the authors to hypothesize that, quote, the Arabization and Islamization of northwest Africa starting in the 7th century AD were cultural phenomena without extensive genetic replacement. Um, EU10 was found to be, so EU10, don't forget, that's uh, JM62. So yeah, our most recent findings, however, uh, suggest that the majority of EU10 
Oh, sorry. Uh, EU10 was found to be the second most frequent haplogroup group in that area. Following the hypothesis of uh, Simino et al. 2000, the authors suggested that this haplogroup group had spread out from the Middle East with a Neolithic wave of advance. Uh, findings, uh, however, suggest that the majority of EU10 chromosomes in North West Africa are due to recent gene flow caused by the migration of Arabian tribes in the first millennia of the Common Era. Uh, in the sample of Northwest Africans, uh, six, oh, 9.1 percent of Y chromosomes studied were EU10. Of these 16 chromosomes, 14 formed a compact microsatellite network. Seven individuals shared a single haplotype, and haplotypes of the other seven were one or two mutational steps removed. Uh, this low diversity may be indicative of a recent founder effect. Uh, where did these chromosomes come from? The highest frequency of EU10 has been observed so far in various Muslim Arab populations in the Middle East. Uh, the most frequent EU10 mi microsatellite haplotype in Northwest Africans is identical to a modal haplotype of uh, Muslim Arabs who lived in a small area of northern Israel, the Galilee. This haplotype, which is present in the Galilee at 18.5%, was termed the modal haplotype of the, of the population. Uh, notably, is absent from the two distinct non-Arab Middle Eastern population, Jews and Muslim Kurds, both of whom who have significant EU10 frequencies, 18 and 12% respectively. Interestingly, this modal haplotype is also the most frequent uh, is also the most frequent haplotype in the population from the town of Sena in uh, Yemen. Its single-step neighbour is the most common haplotype of the Yemeni Hadramut uh, sample. The presence of this particular model haplotype at a significant frequency in the three separate geographic locales, uh, northwest Africa, the southern Lebanon, and Yemen makes independent genetic drift events unlikely. Uh, it should be noted that Yemeni samples were not typed for... Uh, doesn't matter. Uh, the term Arab as well as the presence of Arabs in the Syrian and the Fertile Crescent, is first seen in the Assyrian sources from the 9th century BC. Origin originally referring to the nomads of central and northern Arabia, the term Arabs later came to include the sedentary populations of the south, which had its own language and culture. The term thus covers two different stocks that became linguistically and culturally unified, yet re retained consciousness of their discrete origins. Uh, migrations of southern Arabian tribes northwards have been recorded mainly since the third century, uh, third century AD. Uh, these tribes settled in various places in central and northern Arabia, as well as uh, as well as in the Fertile Crescent, including areas which are now part of Israel. The emergence of Islam in the seventh century uh, BC furthered the unification of the Arabian trial, uh, tribal populations. This unified Arab Islamic community engaged in large movements of expansion, the Fertile Crescent and Egypt being the first areas to be conquered. Uh, it's very difficult to trace the tribal comp composition of the Muslim armies, but it is known that tribes of humanity origin formed the bulk of those Muslim uh, contingents that conquered Egypt in the middle of the 7th century. Uh, Egypt was the primary base for raids further west into the Maghreb, uh, the conquest of North Africa was difficult and took a few decades to complete. Uh, the region was mili militarily and administratively attached to Egypt until the beginnings of the 8th century. Uh, Arab tribes of northern origin entered North Africa as well as both, uh, as well as both troops and migrants. Uh, a major wave of migration from such tribes, the Banu uh, Hilali and the Banu uh, Sulam, uh, occurred in the 11th century. Thus, Arabs, both southern, southern Yemeni and northern, uh, added to the hetero uh, the heterogeneous uh, Mag Maghribi uh, ethnic melting pot. Little is known of the origins of the indigenous populations of the Maghrib, uh, the Berber, uh, the Berbers, except that they have always been a composite people. After the eighth century, a process of Arabization affected the bulk of the Berber Berbers, and the Arab Islamic culture and population absorb absorbed local elements as well. Under the unifying framework of Islam on the one hand, and as a result of the Arab settlements on the other, a fusion took place that resulted in a new ethno-cultural entity over the Maghrib. Uh, in addition, Berber tribes sometimes claimed Arab descent in order to enhance their prestige. Uh, for example, the Berber nomadic tribes of the Western Sahara, uh, the Lamtuna, descended, uh, claimed descent from one of the southern Arabian uh, eponyms, Himya. Uh, whilst uh, one of the chiefs, chiefs of this Berber tribe, uh, Lamtuna, uh, is sometimes referred to as Sahawari, uh, meaning one of the nomads or the one who comes from the Sahara, 
uh, in Arabic sources, however, uh, that the name is seldom used and does not seem to refer to a specific genealogical group. Uh, in light of the uh, this historical data, it's not surprising to find among uh, the Berbers and contemporary Saharawis in Northern Africa, Y chromosomes that have been introduced by recurrent waves of invaders from the Arabian Peninsula. These documented events, together with findings of a particular EU10 haplotype in Yemenis, Palestinians, and Northwest Africans, are suggestive of recent common origins of these chromosomes. Uh, remarkably, the only non Arabs uh, in whom this haplotype has been observed to this date are the Berbers. It appears that EU10 chromosome pool in Northwest Africa is derived not only from early Neolithic dispersions, but also from recent expansions into the, uh, from the Arabian Peninsula. That's the end of the paper. And so what you, what you have here is over these two big, long, you know, fairly complex uh, analyses is you can sort of see from the Fertile Crescent during the Neolithic, this sort of migration down into Arabia and then nothing happening for thousands of years, Islam becoming a thing, and then immediately this explosion of people from, you know, this explosion of people from Arabia. Like they, they say, you know, it, it took a long time, many decades for them to spread and conquer Egypt. And, you know, they're just sort of sitting there for a couple of thousand years doing very little. So it's just this sort of, it, it's just sort of very interesting, like this, this sort of migration, the, the, uh, the I guess you could say the cult, uh, the change in culture and religion, obviously, uh, that sort of spurred this sort of sudden rapid expansionism, and it's really something that hasn't stopped since. Uh, did you guys have any thoughts? Well, yeah, there's a lot in what you've um, <clears throat> been talking about, and some of it touches on what I'm going to talk about. So I'm glad that you've sort of provided a, an introduction to some of that stuff. Uh, they are a migratory people, so. Um, yeah, migration plays heavily into their psychology, their mode of um, cultural organisation. Yeah, it's just really interesting that they just sort of... I, I guess it makes sense, you know, we have very similar things happen in Europe and in Asia a, Asia as well. Like, we just sort of populations will do... Really, when you think about it, kind of nothing, they'll just sort of stay calmly in their own place until something, an event happens, a cultural shift or, you know, cultural and religious shift in this case, and suddenly, like, boom, huge amounts of expansion virtually overnight. Well, yeah, the, it's just, the expansion oh, is sorry. very interesting. And um, it's it's been... Because they were sort of, uh, you know, backwards desert people, and then they ended up with, at the time, the biggest empire in the world in a very short amount of time. Um, it's been suggested that... Muhammad might not have actually existed and that Islam was sort of something imposed on conquered societies to give it some sort of justification. So they were sort of Arab conquests. I mean, I don't know if that's true. It, it could be. It would, it would explain why you're not allowed to draw pictures of him. <laughs> yeah. Well, historically, there has been pictures drawn of him. Um, yeah, that's the funny thing. A, a about lot it. of a lot of sort of Berber and um, non-Arab Muslims had more of that tradition of, of you know drawing pictures of Muhammad and not particularly caring much if other people do it. Well, I, I recall, I believe it was in like the uh, I can't remember the name of it, but the um, the Caliphate that was in Iberia mm. was it just the Iberian Caliphate? What whatever it was, of there actually being like a. Or, or like the sort of Christian style stained glass windows with a you know with a picture of Muhammad on it. Well, yeah, I mean, if if you conquer people, um, a common thing to do is to not mess with their religion too much, or if you do, incorporate their religion into your religion. So religions cross fertilize each other, and of course, there's many instances of large temples that are just taken over, they're converted to mosques, and then maybe some new guy yeah. takes over, gets converted back into it church and, and so on and so forth well, yeah, I was yeah. Say, look at the temples in Israel <laughs> yeah I think something we need to bear in mind when we talk about especially this topic is that this um, current trend of you know really fundamentalist Salafist uh, slash Wahhabist whatever you call it Islam is not the norm in history um, and that it was you know in, in the past and especially during the sort of the conquest period it was a lot more what we would consider, you know, liberal in that sense. Um, you know, it, it didn't have all these kind of uh, very, you know, very Arab, in, in a way, very, very sort of strict and 
um, sort Iconoclastic. of sandy. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> I, I, I just think of like, I just think of kind of modern, you know, Saudi uh, Islam as very, uh, very kind of like the their environment, which is you know just barren and sandy and um, and harsh, uh, and it kind of reflects. Um, it, it reflects the uh, the, the dominant uh, in, in a way it reflects the the dominant geography um, of of the region and I, th- I think that maybe was not the case um, in the past and it's why you see these um, in the, in the different uh, cultures that were taken over you see the the drawings of of Muhammad you see you see a lot of them in kind of um, near um, sort of near West Asia you know the the sort of re- region of the of all the stands you know Turkmenistan Kyrgyzstan etc um they have a tradition I think of of drawing Muhammad as well but I just kind of um wanted to to make that point um so yeah well yeah it's like the the uh you, you can't imagine like ISIS keeping what at the period at that period of time was one of the I think it was the largest library on earth you know most of it wasn't their writings it was collections of other people's writings but you can't even uh, you know, you can't really see modern day Islam keeping that sort of uh, keep, keeping that sort of lore and that, that 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 heritage at all. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure um, Lawrence will probably talk a little bit about this, but um, the the modern fundamentalist Salafist Islam is like their it's their reformation in a way. It's their Protestantism. Uh, you know, it's it's how they've uh, they've kind of got gone back to the roots, kind of like. Um, you know the uh, the iconoclasts of the fifteenth, uh, sixteenth centuries did in in Europe. You know, destroying images and idols and uh, destroying written work. You know, works of art and things like that. So it's it's kind of an interesting parallel, and it's not one that I think people um, you know very. It's not one that many people understand. Um, but if you think about it, I think it it, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of, I, I I feel sort of a bit of an obligation just to mention, you know, it does sound a bit like, you know, we're going on the defensive for Islam at the moment. And just, just to be clear, no, this is just, this is just history. This is just kind of the way it is. They were a lot better, a f- you know, a, a thousand years ago, but they were still yeah. kind of our enemies. <laughs> Like, yeah, I mean, the, I just want to make that very yeah, clear. <laughs> yeah, they, they were never, they, they were always an existential enemy to us, but there was a period where they weren't that different, is I think uh, a way of putting it. As you know, they, they weren't as polarized um, as they are now. Um, and yeah, Car- yeah, Carthage was like hugely Semitic, um, very different culture to like to, to the Romans, um, and you know the. Uh, what are the, the, the like the peoples of uh, Tyr, uh, the, their original city state, um, were the like you know the enemies of Greece, and they had very similar levels of technology and a lot of like cultural back and forth, but they're always considered the enemy. <laughs> so it's just yeah, kind ex- of like exactly. That. Yeah. They're not um, us is the important part. Yes, yes, absolutely. All right, yeah. Sorry, I just felt kind of an obligation to to mention that because. Yeah. You know, what you mean, I the Darwin see... Digest is not the podcast of White Sharia. <laughs> is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, oh God. <laughs> I uh, did you see the the Twitter account like at uh, queer communist? It's like an omni gender degenerate hipster yes. who is yeah. a oh, yeah. Muslim. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm, uh, that, that's, that's just me doxed. <laughs> okay, I see. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's let's move on quickly before anything yeah. happens. Yes. Uh, please. Uh, so, Lawrence, you're going to talk a little bit about uh, the sort of more cultural and historical background. Yes. Uh, to to these people. Yes. Go for it. Okay. Well, there's a lot to talk about, and I think I might even have to cut some material because I've got a fair bit of notes. <clears throat> now, I, I, I apologise for my voice. I have just recovered from a cold, but I'll. Uh, I'll do my best. So where to begin? I think probably the main thing that underpins Arab culture, Arab psychology would be tribalism. And by that, I mean that the fundamental unit of society is the tribe, family, extended family formed into a block. And members of the tribe are all blood related and 
in a tribal society, the tribe are the only people you can trust. You can't trust people from outside your tribe. If they're outside the tribe, then they're, then they're a rival or a, an enemy or they're under your thumb. In the West, we don't really, we don't think like that. We don't wonder what tribe people are from. If you were to ask a Western person what tribe you're from, it wouldn't make any sense. They'd laugh at you. But uh, that is to say that tribalism hasn't existed within European history. Of course it has existed. I know what tribe I'm from. Excuse me. What, the Israeli? <laughs> no, no, um, I'm from the other side of the Hajna line, so we're... Uh, we're more tribal and uh we, we do know which tribe we're from just saying okay fair enough i don't okay yeah well um is eastern europe a, i guess eastern europe might have more of that than western europe yeah yeah i, th- I think that's 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 why the that's why i mentioned the hajna line is um um as as kind of a separator between us and you <laughs> in that way to to okay to put a sort of contrast of what tribalism would be compared to like a western civilization in the west you wouldn't really have a problem putting money in a bank or making big purchases it's very like people in the west will invest a large sum of money sometimes millions tens of millions with people that they've never met and that they're never going to meet and that's a very strange thing and that's dependent on a very high amount of trust and tribal society is not high trust. It's the very opposite of high trust. You don't just go and pump, you know, millions of dollars into people that you don't know in a tribal society because they're rivals. And they're just likely to steal it. So that sort of thing doesn't happen very easily in the Arab world because trust can only extend towards the immediate tribe. And in a tribal society, there's a very rigid pecking order and the relations between tribes are zero-sum affairs. So if one tribe gains in stature, then another tribe loses in stature. And so that means that if there's any injury or any sort of offence or any slight to one tribe, then that means that the elders of the tribe have to engage in this process of careful arbitration to prevent bloodshed coming out. So in, in a tribal society, blood feuds are common. Um... Another aspect of tribal society is that there's no such thing as an objective right and wrong. There's people that are in my tribe are right and people that are outside of the tribe are wrong. So if someone from your tribe murdered someone in cold blood, you don't think, oh, well, he did it. Uh, What he did was bad. You think, well, he's he's related to me. Uh, You know, I'm going to I'm going to side with him irrespective of whether he's to blame or not. And so that, that's why you have blood feuds. Everyone just defends their, their own, irrespective of right and wrong. And the, the very sort of concept of universal right and wrong, that is a very Western concept. It doesn't really exist in, in tribal societies. Um, envy is a big thing that can start a blood feud. If someone has a better car or a more prosperous business or they have a better job, then other people can become envious and that invites sabotage and attack. So as you could probably imagine, in this sort of social organisation, violence is very central to that. It's the glue that holds society together and, and power is determined through violence in that sort of society. And when one power weakens, then ambitious rivals step in and, and that invites attack. Because there's no institutional checks on anything beyond deliberation by tribal elders. There's no mechanism for peaceful transfers of powers as there is in the West. So the social scientist Andrea, Andrea B. Rue writes of tribal society in Egypt, quote, The fabric of life requires that people are constantly involved in assessing their relationships with others, in strengthening some, in developing others, in shoring up reciprocal obligations, in letting some lapse, in mobilising others, and in other ways keeping their networks operational. Conflicts are as much a way of activating and assessing relationships as are pleasant changes. So what she's saying is that it's this patchwork of tribes that are all like rivalrous against each other and you've constantly got to assess where you stand in that pecking order 
one man's gain is another man's loss and insults are very serious offenses because they they bring shame on the tribe I'll, I'll get more into that later but in this sort of society there's only there's only people with power and people who don't have it there's no gradation between those things and that means that there's a power challenge dialectic challenge leads to power and power invites challenge and this means that an idealist doesn't get very far in this type of world so that's why positive sorts of social change don't readily occur in the arab world it's not really the sort of environment that is um hospitable for it when someone takes power they're required to use the same brutal methods of dealing with challenges that were used by the previous power and political doctrine which is very central to people's identity in the west like i'm a liberal i'm a conservative i'm this i'm that in the arab world it's more of a careerist tool a member of the moroccan elite described in his own country as this quote we are all members of a big family perhaps there are 200 of us some call themselves progressives unfpists others istiqualis others monarchists but we all know one another and one shouldn't take our public name calling very seriously today we need support from the us so the monarchists are in power but if our relations with france sour even more and the us does not aid us all we have to do is bring in a unfp or umt government and start knocking on the door of russia and china so you know by unfp they're like communist and socialist parties that were in morocco so that quote is actually pretty old from the cold war but you have the same sort of dynamic going on now now pure tribalism is i mean it's it's in a pure form it's found in the remote village and there is a lot of urbanization in the arab world and where, where it's less common and arabs of course have formed into states with their own flags and their own militaries and all the other trappings of state but tribalism is something that lives on in a sort of cultural dna and explains why their states take the forms that they do another central feature of arab psychology is shame and honor you've probably heard of honor killings and you and you and this is something that a lot of people talk about the the acquisition of honor and the avoidance of shame is kind of central to arab society it's how arabs are ranked um shame is worse than death in arab culture has to be avenged in blood honor can be obtained through power through being wealthy or being generous by being a blood relative of muhammad or through religious piety and honor is something that strengthens the tribe and shame is something that weakens the tribe and this differs from the western conception where things are sort of universally right or wrong honor and shame are not necessarily right or wrong shame can come from being poor or being low in a power hierarchy and for men honor comes from large families especially having lots of sons women have many rules on shame uh, such as modesty and faithfulness and female shame dishonors the whole family and that's something that has to be set right at all costs up to and including murder so that's where you have the the thing of honor killings and the shame honor system makes it hard for, to form wider types of contractual relationships that are common in the west and equality under the law is not something that can be reconciled with a shame on a system because there's no there's no universal right and wrong if you get yourself ahead if you benefit your tribe that's honorable so things like corruption or theft in government are not dishonorable because if you're if you rule the state and you're corrupt and you bring in lots of resources for your tribe then you've benefited your tribe and that's not considered dishonorable you skim off the top and then you share the skim around with your tribe members murder is not in itself dishonorable murdering your way to the top advances the tribe so it's honorable uh, so murdering torturing massacring people none of those things are intrinsically dishonorable the top of arab society is dominated by a very small number of elites and families and government positions are rewards for favored family members 
and loyal clients. And each of them has a family that also need a share of the cut. And allies need their share and the families of allies. So it's, it's a system of patronage, trickle-down theft, I guess, trickle-down corruption. Everyone gets their cut based on their proximity to power. Um, to quote from a book called The Closed Circle, which is, I recommend if people want to delve into this stuff a bit more, uh, quote, to take the everyday matter of wanting to obtain a job, a young man approaches the head of his family or clan, his patron. The head of the family is under obligation to do his very best to make sure his kinsman is given what he asks for. The honour of the whole tribe, or sorry, the honour of the whole family is at stake. If the job is in the gift of someone from another clan or religion, complicated bargaining ensures and quid pro quo is sought. In the event of the job going to someone else, the patron becomes the object of shame and his standing is under threat until such time as he can re-establish it by whatever means and his young kinsman is satisfied. Placing him, the patron, has the right to expect allegiance and loyalty in return. So he himself is taking a career a step forward, whether or not the young man deserved the job is of no consideration. So you can probably tell why that sort of mentality inhibits building the sort of modern economic political structures that we take for granted in the West. For instance, meritocracy. How do, how do you have meritocracy in, a, in an arrangement like that? You can't. Honour and shame are public affairs. So looking honourable is, I guess, just as important, or if not more than actually being honourable. A side effect of that is that, you know, swagger, boasting and theatrics are features of, of, of Arab psychology and Arab culture. Um, between the poles of honour and shame, there's this uncertain territory, which is where most people live. And they have to constantly watch the actions of others for incipient power challenging and response. And these actions might show up winners and losers, and they show up honour and shame. In the West, there are people that lie and people that cheat, but they tend to get caught out through contractual relations with others. When we talk in the West, our speech generally corresponds to our intentions. But in an honor-shame culture like the Arab world, lying and cheating are not moral matters. They're tools for safeguarding honor. In fact, uh, Shia Islam, there's actually the concept of takia, which is, um, or takia, which is uh, the religious ruling permitting when it's, it's uh, okay to lie. But lying isn't done for its own sake. It's done, it's part of the balancing in the honor and shame dynamic. A classic case study in the honor shame dynamic is Egypt's construction of the Aswan Dam. And this was Gamal Abdel Nasser's major project for modernizing Egypt. And it was supposed to be, it's supposed to free the peasants in the Nile Valley from relying on annual flooding and permit year round irrigation. And in 1944, the head of the Ministry of Public Health told NASA that it was a bad idea because the parasites that trans transmitted Bilharzia disease would increase by 75%. Now, Eisenhower pulled out of funding the dam, but Moscow put up the money. But because NASA had staked his whole honour on this dam, the practical considerations then became irrelevant. If he abandoned the project, that would have inflicted shame on him. So... You can see when it gets into large projects, large things to do with the state, it has major ramifications. There's a good article uh, which I recommend for understanding Arab psychology. It's called Why Arabs Lose Wars. And it was written by Norville B. D. Atkin in 1999, and he was a um, U.S. Army colonel and advisor to the Egyptian military. And he gives a rundown of why Arab armies have performed so poorly in modern wars. And through looking at the army, you make inferences about the wider society as a whole. So firstly, one aspect of Arab society is information is power. An officer will hoard information for himself because that makes him important. Um, Atkey noticed that when US trainers distributed manuals to Egyptian tank crews, their commander collected them and took them away. And the Americans asked why he did this. And he said, you don't need to give troops uh, 
manuals because they can't read. But what he really thought was that he wanted to be the only person who understood how the tanks worked because that gave him power and prestige and would therefore make him valuable within the hierarchy. And as a result, troops, um, they might be good at their own technical speciality, but there's very little cross-training. So people don't really understand each other's jobs and that inhibits a smoothly functioning crew. Now that differs from in the West where teaching is itself something prestigious and explaining things. And um, yeah, when, when people are hoarding knowledge for themselves, overall um, society is worse off. Can Another I just jump problem? in for two secs? Uh, yeah. Just because of your specific example of tanks. Um, I watched the Tank Olympics, like it was the last year or the year before, and you look see all like uh, all the Western nations, Germany, America, um, Australia, like and all of the uh, and like Japan and Korea as well. Um, when, when they went through the course, they got you know the course was running at like you know three minutes, three and a half minutes was the, where everyone sort of was, and then you got all of like the Middle East and African countries, and it was like a half hour, <laughs> and it's just that that makes so much sense now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I just that just. That, that was a perfect example for, for something I, I knew before. So please, please continue. Yeah. Um, well, this ties into their problem with education. Uh, most people are probably aware that education is an absolute mess in Arab countries. And one of the reasons for that, amongst others, is that their emphasis is on rote learning, you know, rote um, regurgitation of facts. And that's very unimaginative. And for many centuries, that's, that was the way people um, learnt religion. They wrote memorization of the Quran, was considered all the education you needed. Now, that doesn't cut it very well in a modern industrialized information economy because, um, you know, if the instructions wrote, then you can't reason based on general principles. And that also means you can't do things like think outside the box. If you do that, then you can damage your career. The West has more of an emphasis on, on that sort of thing. So um, people are, are unwilling to show up as superior with a different idea because doing that will, will, will shame your superior. And if you shame your superior, then you get retribution. So initiative in general is discouraged. Um, here's a quote from the article. American military instructors dealing with Middle Eastern students learn to ensure that before directing any question to a student in a classroom situation, particularly if he is an officer, the student does possess the correct answer. If this is not assured, the officer will feel he has been set up for public humiliation. Furthermore, in the often paranoid environment of Arab political climate, he will believe this setup to have been purposeful. The student will then become an enemy of the instructor and his classmates will become apprehensive about their also being singled out for humiliation and learning becomes impossible. Another problem is that in Arab society, the, the hierarchies are very rigid and superiors tend to lord it over their subordinates. Since nobody trusts each other, it's a low trust environment. Discipline has to be maintained through fear because that's the only thing you've got left. So there is the draft in many Arab countries and draftees absolutely hate military service and will do pretty much anything to avoid it, including self-mutilation. In Western forces, one of the backbones of you know a functioning military is the NCO Corps, which bridges the gap between officers and enlisted men. But NCOs don't really exist in Arab militaries and if they do, they're very weak and ineffective. Because officers look down on regular soldiers, instructions poor, uh, because officers, you know, they see instructing other people and getting your hands dirty as, as beneath them, so they don't do it. They consider it below their station. So there's no bridge linking the upper and lower ranks of the military, and that tends to reduce the, the effectiveness and cohesion. Um, a quote from the article, the military price for this is very high. Without the cohesion supplied by NCOs, units tend to disintegrate in the stress of combat. This is primarily a function of the fact that enlisted soldiers simply do not trust their officers. Once officers depart the training areas, training begins to fall apart as soldiers begin drifting off. 
an Egyptian officer once explained to me that the Egyptian army's catastrophic defeat in 1967 resulted from a lack of cohesion within units. The situation, he said, had only marginally improved in 1973. Iraqi prisoners in 1991 showed a remarkable fear and enmity towards their officers. And you see that, I mean, you know, more recently, uh, you know how like America supplied the the post-war Iraqi military with all this good quality gear, and then um, ISIS fires a few shots in the air and they all run away. I mean, they've kind of got a bit of a knack for running away, Arab, Arab military. So that is yeah, an explanation for why that often happens. Because you hear so much about their cowardice. Absolutely. Um, uh, and like breaking a child. Like uh, I, I know, um, I think it was in Afghanistan, like a whole heap of like Afghanis broke, in, like in, literally in front of a bayonet charge. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, right. The British used a bayonet charge. Yeah, they yeah. Ran, yeah they um, ran out of ammo and thought, okay, fuck it, bayonet charge, and it worked. Yeah, why not? Or there the, the were Scots, so. Okay. Um, it makes a lot of sense. But yeah, it's just stuff like that. Like, uh, we've got this stereotype of, I would actually, um, anyone who is a, uh, a, a serviceman in, you know, any, who served anywhere in the Middle East, I guess, like, let us, let us know if this sounds like you know, scarily accurate if it's because like I had never, you know, I, I knew about their, I knew about the whole cowardice thing, but it, you know, the, uh, the, the low trust society and the interaction with that never really clicked until you started talking. So I would actually like to hear if that actually makes a lot of sense, you know, from someone who actually was there and experienced it themselves. Yeah. Well, um, you know, if you read st stories from, people that are serving in the Middle East, um, you know, and trying to train police, trying to train their military. I mean, a lot of the stories just reinforce it again and again. I mean, there are some people who say, yeah, there are competent professional people there. And there are many other stories that say, yeah, it's, a, it's an absolute disaster trying to get anything done. It's like basically trying to run a kindergarten. Yeah, that's pretty much what I've heard about the place. It's not like... I wouldn't want to be working there. <laughs> well, there's a good um, vice. It's not for um, Arabs. It's it's set in Afghanistan, but it's uh, some of the British troops working with the Afghanistan National Army and just like they're all smoking pot and just running out in open, spraying bullets in the air. And the British are like, what are you doing? You're wasting ammunition. And they just don't get it. And uh, um, they're, they're vice documentaries. And even though vice is a hugely libtard, newspaper their documentaries are actually really good so i recommend uh chasing that up but yeah when they're when they've got like a non-terrible premise they generally do not a terrible job yeah yeah i think vice actually had some like more conservative people that founded it but um eventually became hugely shit lib it was uh gavin mckinnis was one of the founders of it wasn't he yeah he was yeah yeah mm. yeah, so, yeah but their documentary yeah. is actually pretty good i recommend them the the, the uh, Liberia one is is great. If you've got a strong stomach, lots of cannibalism and stuff. Yeah, I, I've seen that. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, because hier hierarchies are so re rigid, then that means decision making power is restricted to the very upper echelons, and that e that includes even minor decisions that would just be farmed out to anyone in a in a Western military. A quote from the article, U.S. trainers often experience frustration obtaining a decision from a counterpart, not realizing that the Arab officer lacks the authority to make the decision, a frustration amplified by the Arab's understandable reluctance to admit that he lacks that authority. So, yeah, bringing shame into it again. If you admit that you can't make that decision, you shame yourself, so you avoid making it, even though doing that in itself causes more problems. Arabs have what is known in psychology as an external locus of control. And that means that they believe external forces rather than their own action is responsible for their outcomes. Now, that is so prolific in, in Arab mentality, culture, psychology, blaming others for their, like basically blaming other people for your problems. Um, that is a bad thing because it leads to less self-reflection and actual fixing of problems. Taking responsibility for a failure brings shame on the person doing it. So that means that blunders just persist 
and incompetent people stay in positions of, of responsibility instead of being removed. A quote, um, as for equipment, a vast cultural gap exists between the US and Arab maintenance and logistics systems. The Arab difficulties with US equipment are not, as sometimes simplistically believed, a matter of Arabs don't do maintenance, but in fact something much deeper. The American concept of a weapon system does not convey easily. A weapon system brings with it specific maintenance and logistics procedures, policies, and even a philosophy, all of them based on US culture, with its expectations of a certain educational level, sense of small unit responsibility, tool allocation, and doctrine. Tools that would be allocated to a US battalion, a, US, uh, a unit of some between six and 800 personnel would most likely be found at a much higher level, probably two or three echelons higher in an Arab army. The expertise, initiative, and most importantly, the trust indicated by delegation of responsibility to a lower level are rare. The US equipment and its maintenance are predicated on a concept of repair at the lowest levels and therefore require delegation of authority. Without the needed tools, spare parts or expertise available to keep equipment running and loath to report bad news to his superiors, the unit commandment, commander looks for scapegoats. All this explains why I many times heard in Egypt that US weaponry is too delicate. Um, so yeah, acceptance of personal responsibility is a big thing that never happens and um, that has bad effects down the line. Um, take for you've got like Saudi Arabia. It, ha it has an on paper. It's got an army with the latest gear, with top of the line U.S. planes. Um, they're rich. They're flush with oil money, so they they can spend big. That's everything on paper. In reality, it's a flying club for princes. They buy all this expensive gear, and do you know who actually does the maintenance of it? Contractors from Europe, the U.S. mainly. Or, you know, other Western countries. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's basically a sort of society run by foreigners, run by, like, foreign mercenaries and things. So because there's so little trust outside of the tribe and familial relations, that means combined arms operations are difficult. There's little coordination between infantry, artillery, air force, logistics, and so on. And this is crucial for a modern army because Arab armies have a dual role in not only defending the country, but also defending the regime in power, which, is, which there's no actual mechanism for changing. So, you know, dictatorships, they're a two-edged sword. Arab elites constantly have to worry about military coups. So Arab leaders rarely want any military unit becoming too powerful or getting too close to other units. Not only that, but there's very little cross-training between... Arab armies, um, which are far too suspicious of each other. Like the US, for instance, would frequently conduct drills and training exercises with, well, everyone, Britain, Europe, Australians, South Americans, Israelis, Japanese, South Koreans. I mean, you name it, the, the US regularly drills and conducts training exercises. That's not going to happen in the Middle East. They, these regimes do not trust each other enough to let their armies cross over each other's borders but uh yeah so that's one thing why they don't fight effectively together and another thing is that yeah they don't have coordination even within their own armies um secrecy is a big thing in, in these sort of arrangements um anything military related is classified even mundane mundane stuff like promotions and un unit designations a quote from the article, prior to the 1973 war, Sadat was surprised to find that within two weeks of the date he had ordered the armed forces to be ready for war, his minister of war, General Muhammad Sadiq, had failed to inform his immediate staff of the order. Should a war, Sadat wondered, be kept secret from the very people expected to fight it? So, yeah, going back to that sort of thing, how knowledge is... Uh, closely guarded because <laughs> i'm sorry i'm just laughing at that like okay yeah we're, we're going to war you know a you week into the it. war and it's like <laughs> the officer under you is like they're, they're bombing us sir it's like what's happening he's like well we're at war like it just <laughs> yeah oh it's so retarded oh. talk about low trust Jesus. oh yeah definitely yeah. sorry i just like 
uh, it's impressive. Oh yeah, it is. It's uh, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, you take so yeah. many things for granted in the West, and and they just don't exist in places like the Middle East. Oh, I'm I'm left kind of. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll leave it to you to you've wrapped up because it's a good conversation point. But yeah, yeah, p- please continue. Okay. <laughs> like, I, I'm, I'm highly entertained right now. Oh, that's good. I'm glad you are. Another major aspect of Arab psychology is fatalism. Uh, they have a saying, um, Allah wills, you know, um, inshallah, Allah. They, they add on the end of sentences all the time. It means Allah wills it. So this ties into external locus of control as well. They don't really believe they're responsible for anything. They believe God controls everything. And that means that things like training accidents are very common. Um, Safety tends to be very poor. Um, One proposed reason why Christian Europe came to dominate the sciences was that the European church held the doctrine that the universe was a system that God set up, but he doesn't actually micromanage everything in it. So um, if you accepted that as a doctrine, that would imply that the universe can therefore be explained in terms of general laws, as opposed to Islam, which would say, uh, for instance, if a candle blew out, they would say that Allah willed the candle to blow out, not because there's a differential in air pressure. So in medieval Christianity, scholars held that God could not do anything that was logically impossible, such as creating a square circle or making two plus two equal five. But in Islam, Allah could do all of these things. So it, it makes absolutely no sense. But that's that's something that is proposed as to a reason why the West won out in terms of um, you know being the forefront of scientific innovation. Um, of course, I don't think that that's entirely it. I think that there was also the biological thing, but it's probably something that played a role. So in the Arab world, you have a lack of care about safety. And um, given that the elite care so little about ordinary soldiers as it is, then that definitely makes things worse. And the end result, bad morale. And you, you, you don't want that in a military. Um, okay, so I guess, you know, when you think Arabs, you think you know, the major problem coming out of that region is, is of course, the Islamic terrorism. And the root of it, many people try to get to it. Probably no one ever will, but I'll throw some things out there, see what sticks. The basis of Islam was that it was really one of the first challenges to the tribal structure because Islam said that irrespective of tribe, everyone's equal before God. All you have to do is pray, give alms, fast, make your pilgrimage to Mecca, and then you're a Muslim. So irrespective of any sort of tribal, familiar, ethnic, linguistic, or any other sort of affiliations. So in doing that, Muhammad subsumed all tribes and bound all tribes into one, which let them expand out. So previously, the Arabs would have been in a variety of pagan religions. There were Christians, there were Jews, um, and he united all tribes into a formidable force that spread an empire from, well, Iberia to India, parts of Asia. So it's pretty extensive. And um, in Islam, there's the concept of the House of Islam, which are which is any part of the world that has been previously conquered by Islamic rule. Now, outside of that, you have the House of War, which are the places that are as yet unconquered. So... Well, if you set up the world into that sort of dichotomy, you're not going to have very peaceful relations with people. You're either like conquered or at war with people you haven't conquered yet. So as a result of that, Islam has bloody borders. And wherever it butts up against non-Islamic people, you have that conflict. So take, um, well, it goes back to the, to explain the concept, consider the Lebanese civil war between 1975 and 1990. You had Christians, you had Muslims fighting over a lot of differences, political, cultural, and, yeah, religious differences. And the capital Bay route was divided into Muslim and Christian sections by what's called the Green Line. And it was called the Green Line because it was a no-man's land where only grass and weed survived. And you could take that concept and extrapolate it out into the Muslim world at large and because there are green lines all over the place. There's a green line between India and Pakistan. 
India was partitioned after independence and um, there's many Muslims remaining in India and Islamic terrorism has been a feature of India for many decades. Indonesia and the Philippines have green lines between the more fanatical and the more moderate tribes. China has, and we've talked about this previously, a large Muslim community that generates a lot of violence. So there's another green line. Um, a lot of Islamic terrorism comes out of Afghanistan. Chechnya has a green line with Russia. Africa has green lines south of the Sahel region. Many African countries are split by religious differences. There are Muslims predominant in the north with Christians and animists in the south. Take, say, Nigeria. That's a, a very bad hotspot. Um, the Chad, uh, the Sudan. Um, you have Muslim Somalis in the north of the country, which have... Um, traditionally raided the Christians and animists in the south, uh, at least when they weren't fighting each other. And the Middle East, to go back to our topic um, of focus, that has many non-Muslims. It's like a pizza pie with religious and ethnic pockets dotted all around the place with their own communities. And the only non-Muslims to have their own state in the region is Israel, Lebanon was originally going to be designated a Christian state by the French, but that arrangement fell apart. And even though that arrangement fell apart, it was for a long time majority Maronite Christian. But, well, um, they didn't keep up in the bedroom and a lot of them fled the civil war. So there's actually more Lebanese Christians outside of Lebanon than in it. So that has had major demographic um, consequences. There's about 5 million Coptic Christians in Egypt, so that's another large non-Muslim population in the Middle East, and they undergo various um, types of persecution, both official and uh, not really so much official in, in sort of written constitution, everyone's equal, but in practice, no, nah, that doesn't happen. Small pockets of Christians exist all over the Middle East, um, mainly Iraq, Syria, not really Saudi Arabia, um, unless you count the migrant workers, of course. In that case, you might consider it a Christian majority country. Um, but these minorities are persecuted pretty heavily, and many are forced to either migrate uh, or get killed. And um, the Druze and Alawites are, are some minority splinter sects of Islam that, that have been traditionally persecuted. And the reason those things exist, because when Islam conquered these people, they're given a choice of either convert or become second class citizens with a separate tax rate and, and various restrictions on their religious practice. So many people just pretended to be Muslim. Yeah, yeah, yeah I convert, pretend to be a Muslim, but in secret practice your old traditions and rituals. And um, many Muslims... Uh, you know, they, they consider these sects that did that to be heretical and fit to be persecuted or killed. And um, one way that these sects have survived is by allying themselves with the people in power to protect themselves or, failing that, take power outright as they did in Syria. The Druze, they allied themselves with Israel, which is the regional superpower. Well, in Israel, they allied themselves quite heavily with the state. The Druze in Israel are considered very loyal, um, skilled trackers, skilled fighters, and many Druze are in high positions in, in military command and government and business, and non-Jews are exempt from the draft in Israel, but um, the Druze actually said, we don't want to be exempt, we want to be, we want to be drafted. And in Syria, the Druze um, allied themselves with the Alawite government. So they have a reputation in the region as being a sort of weather vane. They sense when power is on the ascendancy or on the decline, and they make their alliances accordingly. And that is how this small and persecuted community managed to survive. So, you know, that's, that's really written within their culture. So if the Druze back someone, then they're generally considered a good bet. Another major green line is the green line with Iran, where there's differences, not only the Sunni-Shia sectarian split, but also an ethnic Arab-Persian split. The Persians are Indo-Europeans and the Arabs are Semitic. Uh, Eastern Europe has green lines. The Albanians and Bosnians have been a source of violence and strife for a very long time. 
and now Western Europe has green lines, no-go zones, uh, immigrant Muslim ghettos. These are places where Islamists recruit people, um, you know, feeding off, uh, you know, isolation and, you know, their relative lack of economic and political performance. Um, Islam once had a vast empire, but, you know, it's run out of steam. It's, you know, there's no there's no innovations in science or technology in Islam coming since the last 1,000 years or so, possibly even more. And they couldn't really embrace the political and economic modernizations that made the West and then East Asia rich. So Muslims, they found themselves under European colonial rule or the rule of a local despot. And when colonialism came to an end, that left dictatorships and these dictatorships are corrupt they're very incompetent they mismanage the economy and they really have no genuine respect in the world now arab nationalism was one thing that they tried in the 60s and 70s and um, interestingly enough arab nationalism was actually a lot of the um, theoreticians that formulated it were christians and not um, muslims because if christians are persecuted then coming up with an ideology that binds all Arabs together, kind of like what Muhammad did with Islam, is a way for Christians to protect themselves. So that's an explanation for why Christians were a lot of the early leaders of Arab nationalism and Baathism. But, uh, you know, it was in general a majority Muslim sort of movement and, and, and the leaders were Muslim. So you had Gamal Abdul Nasser in Egypt and he was the major figurehead of the movement. And Baathism took power with the Assad family in Syria and the Saddam family in Iraq. Um, Arab nationalism, it did fall apart, uh, mainly because, well, two reasons, the war with Israel that they lost. And also, I, I just described how it's a pizza pie of ethnicities, religions. Um, Arab nationalism couldn't paper over those significant schisms. Um, even just tribalism itself, one tribe doesn't trust another. So you can't really paper over those things with just based on, you know, being Arab or, you know, uh, speaking Arabic. And of course, there are not, you know, something like um, 30 percent are non-Arab in that region. So um, Arab nationalism didn't work. But uh, one, one major reason why it collapsed was um, they started a war with Israel and they were humiliatingly defeated after six days. And it's pretty fascinating, the 1967 Six-Day War, because you had the combined might of Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, with support from Palestinian militias and support from pretty much every Arab country. And the Arab nationalist governments were allied with the Soviet Union. So they were getting some of the Soviets' best gear. They were getting gear that Soviet troops didn't even have. And they lost after six days against Israel, which is a country, and if you look at it on the map, it's a speck that you can barely even see. So what explains that? Well, IQ explains a lot of it, I think. I call it the IQ war, but IQ and culture explain why they did so poorly. I mean, losing in six days, and really I was, it was even sort of over less than that, six hours. Um, so... Arab nationalism was a big failure. So the other competing sort of pan-Arab unifying ideology would be the Islamic um, Islamism, Islamic dictatorship, which is, you know, another sort of utopian thing that's going to solve all the problems of the region. And um, so it's, it's the solution to all the other forms of government that didn't work. The government supposedly in such a society would lay down Islamic law and then everything would be perfect. And that kind of sounds stupid, but, you know, to people that live in a society where there's just a bunch of thugs and crooks in charge, that, that sounds convincing. But they don't, in the real world, they don't work. Um, Iran has a religious dictatorship and people don't like it. They're, they're sick of it. It's corrupt. It's brutal. It, has, it hasn't brought prosperity. And being bossed around by a bunch of religious nuts, that's not a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, and, and especially when you can't argue with them because they're on a mission from God. So no one particularly likes that. And people tend to get sick of it. Pakistan 
um, was a sort of semi-Islamic state, I guess. And um, you had hardline Islamic religious violence um, coming out of Pakistan. Um, in general, although we just talked about how it, you know, um, of the, the hardline sort of violent Islamic terrorism isn't the norm. Yeah, yes and no. Um, it's not a new thing. It has something that has continually flared up in the Muslim world over the centuries. But it tends to go too far and then get smacked down by, you know, one of the power. They either piss off a foreign power and get smacked down or they piss off a local power and get smacked down. But the first Islamic terrorists were the assassins or the Hashashin, where the word assassin comes from. So they're called um, Hashashin because they smoked... Um, weed before they went on an assassination which kind of sounds a bit stupid i mean you know way to kill the buzz but uh <laughs> that's what they did and that's where our word assassin comes from it and the the hashishin were an offshoot sh sect of shia islam and they lived in the mountains of persia around the second millennium ad and they carried out suicide attacks with knives and they ended up pissing off the Mongols, and that's generally not a good career move, and the Mongols wiped them out. But flare-ups of religious violence is something that has never really gone away. And many Muslims believe in the sort of um, the sort of stuff that Al-Qaeda and ISIS preaches. I mean, the psychology of Arabs, as, as we've talked about, is very paranoid. It's very conspiratorial. They embrace a lot of fantasies about like glorious golden ages and then they like to blame their problems on other people. It's widely believed in the Arab world that Islamic terrorism is not actually carried out by Muslims. They believe it's a plot by Mossad or the CIA or the US government and they believe things that like 9-11 was not carried out by Arabs but carried out by the CIA in order to justify a war on Islam. And, you know, like someone in the West that thinks that, like they're a fringe kook, but in the Arab world, that's kind of a very normal thing, even like educated guys. Now, in the West, I think a lot of the educated ones, they know to sort of tone that stuff down. But back home, they know that that's how people think. Uh, just look at what's broadcast in Arabic on the Arab media, that sort of stuff. And until recently, that hasn't been a problem for the West because the Ottoman Empire ruled the Arabs. And uh, there was a, you know, Western diplomats often heard Turkish diplomats complain about their Arab subjects. The Turks had a saying, never involve yourself in the affairs of the Arabs. And that sounds like pretty good advice to me. The Ottoman Empire was defeated after World War I. And that meant that Britain and France found themselves in charge of millions of Arabs. And so they tried to turn these provinces, these Ottoman provinces, into separate nation states. But, you know, these states were not very stable. During World War II, there was some Nazi involvement in the Middle East to try and uh, stir up uprisings against the British. There were Nazi radio stations in Egypt broadcasting pro-Nazi propaganda in Arabic, claiming that the Nazis and Muslims are natural allies against Britain and Jews. And the, the Arabs admired Nazi anti-Semitism. And even Iraq was briefly run by a, a pro-Nazi government. Uh, the British couldn't afford to have a Nazi ally sitting on top of the world's largest oil reserve. So they invaded with a few divisions and conquered it in three weeks and put someone more reliable in charge. But after World War II, uh, the region was torn between like Arab nationalist, Arab socialist dictators and sort of monarchies. And the other new feature of the region that emerged after World War II was, of course, the, the state of Israel. When the UN declared the state independent, the Arabs um, told Arabs living in the region to flee and they said, we'll invade and then we'll carve up the, the spoils afterwards. But uh, the Arabs were actually defeated and that came as a shock to a lot of people. Even though Arab military school skill was not held in very high esteem, Jewish military skill was not considered much better. So that came as a bit of a shock to the world. Um, the Israeli government studied what led Arabs to perform so badly, and their conclusion was that the Arab states are crippled by corruption and self-delusion and their problems that persist today. The, um, the Jordanians, they thought, were an exception. They 
managed to retain the training that they received from the British. And Jordan is a bit less shitty than some other countries in the region. Um, the Arabs fought five major wars against Israel, lost all of them badly, even though Israel was vastly outnumbered and outgunned. Jordan made peace in 1967, but um, the Arab states continue to, continue to publicly proclaim that Israel has to be destroyed. And, and so you have the Palestinians refusing peace because they believe that one day the Arab countries are going to deliver on their promise and, and destroy Israel and, and, and you know, share the spoils of war to them. So delusion is a major component of Arab psychology. And so you've got a lot of Arabs living in refugee camps. They're living off UN welfare. And even though the West is uh, expected to take refugees, Arab states don't take refugees. They, they refuse the, um, the Palestinian refugees. Um, Jordan actually found itself ruling over a Palestinian majority when it annexed the West Bank. And the PLO actually established a base in the West Bank. Um, and they behaved as thugs. They ran extortion rackets and they eventually tried to overthrow the Jordanian government. And the Jordanian government went to war with them in 1970, kicked them out. That was known as Black September. Um, there was an Olympics uh, in, which, uh, in Munich and there was a uh, uh, Palestinian terrorists um, called the Black September Movement. And it was a very bizarre thing. Um, this was in the 70s. And um, the Olympics was going on while terrorists were holding a bunch of athletes hostage. And everyone was just going along like nothing was happening. I mean, it was extremely bizarre. Um, the Palestinians, uh, they got kicked out of Jordan. They went to Lebanon. Um, the PLO and uh, they behaved the same way and they ended up um, initiating the Lebanese civil war um, and so that's why nobody really wants them like Kuwait actually accepted Palestinian refugees and they sided with Saddam Hussein when Saddam invaded Kuwait so the Kuwaiti government kicked out all the Palestinian refugees that they accepted and they were actually fairly tolerant like they actually let Palestinian refugees have jobs and work in the universities and stuff but after they betrayed the government by supporting Saddam's invasion they were all kicked out so nobody really wants these people um, yeah uh, Israel's actually 20% Arab so that's a you know even though it's a Jewish state it is um, does have a large Arab population um, most of them are descended from the Arabs who didn't flee the war and it's sort of a paradox. If those 700,000 Arabs actually stayed, then today they would have outnumbered what were at the time the 600,000 Israelis, and they'd currently be a majority in a democratic state. So they could have just simply voted for um, kicking all the Jews out or, or whatever they wish to do. Of the remaining 80% Jews, 50% of them are Mizrahi Jews, and they're Jews that... They're descendants of Jews that were kicked out of Arab countries or fled persecution, um, mainly from places like Iraq, um, some from Syria. And um, yeah, there, there's actually uh, the Mizrahi tend to not do as well economically and um, socioeconomically compared to um, Ashkenazi Jews. And, you know, IQ was a big part of that. Mizrahi Jewish IQ was not very much higher than the Arab average, which is 86. But uh, within the region, uh, you could say that Israel is the superpower, but it's not the only power that can slap around Arabs at will. Persia has been doing that for centuries. And another major war in the region was, you know, Saddam Hussein. When he seized power in the 60s, he forgot that very important lesson that Persia can slap around Arabs at will. So he, st he started um, a war with Iran because Iran at the time was racked by revolution. And he thought that he could take advantage of it when it was unstable, grab some oil fields and then sue for peace afterwards. But that didn't end up happening, even though um, Iran was, you know, in a hugely cha chaotic um Situation, they still managed to fend off Iraq. And this war um, led to millions of deaths on both sides. Uh, both sides used chemical weapons. 
And at the end of the day, no side budged an inch. I mean, at the end of the war, they were both still at the same board as they started. In 1988, there was a ceasefire and Iraq was massively in debt to pay for this war. And so Saddam decides to invade Kuwait, who we actually owed $10 billion. And the Western powers said, you're not going to do that. And then a US-backed coalition invaded, drove out the Iraqi army and demanded that Saddam pay reparations, release POWs, turn over chemical weapons stocks and generally stop being a dick. Now, the US actually wanted regime change after the first Gulf War, but the Saudis were against it and they only entered into the coalition on the guarantee that they would not change the government. Now, the reason was because the Saudis are Sunni and the government of Iraq was Sunni. Now, even though um, the Sunnis were being dicks, and uh, I mean, the Sunnis in Iraq were being dicks and threatening to invade Saudi Arabia, they still didn't want regime change in the country because that would lead, or democracy would have led to a Shia-run country because the Shia are the majority. So democracy... um, they, they weren't much in favour of there. That, that, of course, that's a reason why democracy doesn't work in the region, because if you have a society that is divided up in these tribal, religious, sectarian divisions, then it's basically if you're the majority, you win. And um, a lot of minorities don't really like that. So they think that the better option is just to basically take over the country and run it instead. So the Saudis said that well, they, they would actually take care of Saddam themselves. They said they'd assassinate Saddam and put someone that's less troublesome in charge, but that never ended up working out because um, Saddam was very paranoid and he ran an elaborate police state on the sort of Nazi communist model. Uh, The interesting thing about Arabs is they don't do much, but they do run police states really well, so they're fairly revolution-proof and coup-proof. The... um, or, or not. I mean, that's the thing about those sorts of governments. They're good until they work until they don't, and then they don't work really bad. Um, the Arab nationalist governments that emerged in the 60s were allied with the Soviet Union, so that you had Soviet advisors teaching them how to run these sort of security states. After World War II, the Middle East was also a destination for fleeing Nazi war criminals. You had a look. Alwa Brunner, he fled to Syria and was instrumental in setting up the, or in advising the government. Um, Arabert Haim fled to Egypt and uh, ended up converting to Islam. Johan von Leers was another, or Johan's probably pronounced, von Leers was another guy. He fled to Egypt, um, converted to Islam and worked for NASA's propaganda ministry. Anyway, Saddam used body doubles and he built all these palaces for himself and so he was hard to assassinate. He did this even though they were un- he was under economic sanctions. And he, there was this thing going around at the time that he never slept in the same place twice. That's, that's why he, he did that, because he was under threat of assassination by the Saudis. He also feared an Iranian attack. He, like... Iraq has always been paranoid of Iran, historically going back centuries. So he wanted Iran to think that he still had chemical weapons and a nuclear program. So he never like refused to admit that he didn't have them outright. But um, you know he didn't particularly care that his people were starving either because he thought that he could starve his people and then everyone would feel sorry for him and then take away the sanctions and that would allow him to rearm. So... After kind of doing that kind of sort of game, um, the US invaded in 2003. His army folded in three weeks, which, if you remember, was how long it took to fold in 1990 and how long it took the British in 1941 and also how long it took the British in 1914. Hey, at least he's consistent. Yeah, the three-week rule. In, In and out in three weeks. I mean, the war's easy. It's just setting up a piece that's difficult. So Saddam knew that his government was doomed, but his plan B was supporting a Sunni terrorist insurgency. And um, so he cultivated that and uh, allowed Sunni terrorists to run rampant and and kill Shia and start a civil war. Now, this is kind of funny and it's not going to make much sense to you, but he believed the civil war would cause neighbouring Sunni countries like Saudi Arabia to intervene 
and restore Sunni rule, maybe even putting him back in charge. Now, that sounds crazy, and it is, but that's the sort of thinking that dominates this region. People think crazy shit. Um, of course, none of these, uh, none of the Saudis or the other um, Sunni powers are going to lift a finger to put Saddam back on the throne, but they were willing to use Iraq as a safety valve for their own terrorists. A curious factor of the region, and this is something important to keep in mind, is that every Arab country has terrorist and extremist cells. And a good way to get rid of them is to give them some cash, give them some guns, and send them over the border to bother someone else. And in a place where military effectiveness is poor, the use of these terrorist groups as a check on rival regimes is a deterrent. So terrorist groups are a major sort of chess piece in the politics of the region. Eventually, the Sunni terrorists in Iraq were defeated and um, the country had to kind of sort of at least pretend to be a bit democratic. But then the, um, the Sunni are very sore about um, not being in power anymore. They used to run the country and they received perks and benefits from the government. Um, something that troops noticed was that Sunni areas had much better infrastructure than Shia areas that had really shitty streets and electrical wiring and, and other stuff. Because the Sunni, as I described before, you get in power, you, you spread the wealth around to your tribe, to your um, kin. And so, yeah. So, yeah, they, they're not very happy about losing power. Um, in the end, not much has changed. Iraq is still corrupt and you've got elected officials that are backing terrorist groups, so not a lot has changed. So... Military humiliation is one of their gripes. Um, even though billions of dollars has poured into um, the Gulf states, their education systems are total shit and they've got undeveloped markets and they've got little to show for all of this wealth in terms of actual scientific or cultural, economic, political, any sort of achievement. Now, the Gulf Arabs... They've given themselves easy jobs and they've brought in foreigners to do all the actual work. And these are mostly South Asians, Indians, um, Africans or Arabs from non-oil producing states like Egypt. They're doing all the actual work that the, um, that the Gulfies uh, look down upon. And because um, they consider manual labor beneath them and uh, the middle managers are often um, Lebanese and upper management are Europeans, Americans, Australians, New Zealanders, that sort of thing. And these people are paid exorbitant salaries to run the country for these princes. Saudi Arabia, for instance, is demographically only 10% Arab. The rest of the people living there are foreign workers. Uh, so it's actually a Muslim minority country, Arab minority country. Of course, they're not citizens. They're guest workers treated like total shit. Or they're the highly paid, um, you know, Western foreigners that are kind of running things. But of the Arab population, 90% of them are unemployed and only 10% of them are actually looking for a job because in these oil-rich states, they, they've got, you know, they live well off welfare and subsidies. So my voice is getting a bit sort of nasally, so I'll try and, try and get through this quickly. Um, in the UAE... They're a bit more entrepreneurial. Only 80% of the Arabs are unemployed. But um, it's interesting that East Asian countries lifted themselves out of poverty and built world-class economies and institutions, even though they have no oil and no natural resources. Well, they did have one resource, IQ, and that explains a lot. So um, a lot of Islamic terrorism comes from Saudi Arabia and... Um, the Wahhabi sect, who people have probably heard of, they're a sect of Islam that's always been dicks, more intolerant, more strict, and they've dominated the Arabian region. Now, the Saud family, the House of Saud, they owed their... They united the country by defeating all the other tribes, and they owe their power in part to an alliance with the Wahhabi sect. So that's why so many of that, so, so much of this Islamic radicalism comes out of Saudi Arabia. The, um, they were the muscle that allowed the Sauds to conquer the place. Now, the Sauds 
realize that you know having these dicks running around um, isn't really good for you in the long term it, it would hurt the kingdom but um, many of these clerics are opposed to sort of modernism modern technology unless it's guns they're for that but other modern technology they don't like radios cars um, gadgets all that sort of stuff and um, in the 1970s there was a serious outbreak of Islamic terrorism and um, the siege of Mecca that people might have heard of and, and so the Sauds the ruling Sauds made a deal with the clerics the the, the clerics and the, the nutcases could run the education system but the um, the Sauds would run like economics and foreign policy so yeah the schools and all the sort of cultural institutions are nutcase religions and they've got like lifestyle police that patrol looking for un-Islamic things and uh, that sort of thing and so in order to control their own internal Islamic radical problem the government cut a deal with them and you know it, obviously that's not a good long-term solution but a lot of the propaganda these guys were putting out went into um, Afghanistan during the Soviet invasion and they fund madrasas that are Islamic schools where you learn um, the Quran off by heart and you learn stuff about how you know go to war against the infidels everyone's against us got to you know purge the world of the unbeliever all the hardline Islamic radical stuff and that went into um, Pakistan as well because um, Pakistan uh, a lot of the Islamic radicals in the Pakistani government uh, were behind this sort of thing they created the Taliban as their proxy in Afghanistan um, in Palestine um, you've got loyalties that are divided by Hamas and Fatah so I guess you've got another green line within a green line there um, Gazans are a bit more crazy more into the sort of Islamic terrorism West Bank is a bit more into education and critical thinking and um, actually some of the people who are most are at the forefront in fostering change in the Arab world changing in, in mentality are the Saudis so that seems sort of contradictory yet at the same time it isn't because the Saudi is the Saudi state is an arrangement between the government which doesn't really care for the Islamic crackpot stuff but they've cut a deal with people who do care about that so the Saudi government um, actually the Saudi king in 2007 got up in front of the Arab League and said Arab problems are caused by bad leadership which is a pretty bold statement for them to make but it's then again not really unusual for them um, outside of the oil backed Gulf states Arab economies are very poor um, barely above Africa in some respects in some respects lagging behind Africa if you can imagine that and as the Saudi leadership <coughs> has pointed out Islamic terrorists they started attacking the West and non-Muslims when their own terror campaigns against their own states failed there was if you think back there was an Islamic terrorist insurgency this was before all the stuff with the war on terror in 9-11 before that you had Islamic insurgencies in Egypt in the 90s there was one in Algeria there was one in Syria between 1976 and 1982 that was put down with ex extreme brutality so their own revolts against their own governments didn't work um, as I mentioned Arab states can't do much but they can run police states pretty well so the Islamists <coughs> excuse me they changed their tactic and they thought instead of attacking the near enemy they would attack the far enemy like the United States and you know they should do that rather than immediately try to establish Islamic dictatorships and so that you know that's why Al Qaeda started attacking the West they were sort of the vanguard of this new sort of attacking the far enemy strategy so you had the bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993 um, they tried to bring down both towers but they failed to do it they bombed the US embassies in East Africa in 1998 they bombed the USS Cole in 2000 in 2001 they hijacked uh, two commercial airlines and flew them into the World Trade Center um, and the main differences between now and the early 90s is there are bigger 
uh, Muslim diasporas in the West and the masterminds of 9-11 were actually coordinating at a mosque in Germany. So, you know, that's that green line that is a danger for us. It used to not be a danger because they were over there and run by the Ottomans. Now the situation's completely different. But uh, there are some Arabs who recognize that, you know, they are the, the cause of their own problems. Uh, corruption and police state tactics are the rule of the day. Um, so when you've got that, the only alternative is like ISIS. So that, you know, becomes attractive to people. Uh, you've got, as a sort of difference to that, Mauritania. They actually have a, an elected government. Um, Morocco was fairly moderate. And um, that might be due to... Um, Morocco actually escaped Ottoman rule and existed sort of independently and having some sort of coherence as a nation state. A lot of the instability comes from the fact that they aren't coherent nations. They're divided by tribe. They're divided by ethnicity, religion, and a lot of other things. Uh, that can't be like, you know, you've got Iraq as the classic case where it's not a coherent country. Sunni, Shia, minorities of Christians, ethnic Kurds in the north. Um, Tunisia, that used to be pretty moderate, um, actually a popular tourist hotspot for Europeans. They don't have oil, but they're actually more well off than other non-oil producing Arab countries. And one reason why that might have been a bit more um, better off is because Tunisia is actually the region of Carthage. So it had some sort of cohesive identity behind it. Um, yeah, my, my throat's getting really sore, so I'm going to like wrap it up. But yeah, so yeah, yeah, man, you've been going for a while. So um, yeah, well, thanks. That's, uh, we, we picked probably the wrong week for you to have like your, I guess, um, pretty much your ex like area of expertise <laughs> you know the week that you're recovering from sickness so you know good job uh good job me i guess but um yeah it's a, a lot of stuff to cover there uh but what i found really really interesting was uh uh the idea of social trust it seems it's a it's a lot more important than previously thought uh and i i wonder if kind of like one of the major reasons for like the European ascendancy was the fact that we had that social trust so we could have like this uh, more uh, integrated and more modern sort of military system. And we were able to do that. We were able to make that. And basically uh, the Arabs weren't able to keep up in that regard. And pretty much everyone else like throughout, you know, Africa, the Middle and Near East uh, weren't able to, were not able to keep up with us. Um, I, I agree completely, yeah. Here's, yeah, here's a... Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, go. Okay, well, a possible explanation that has been put forward for why Arabs have that sort of tribal low trust uh, social political environment. The Arab region, and, and this was touched on in previous commentary, so I, I'm, I'm glad I remembered to, to bring it up. It's a desert, and there's small patches of arable land, like around the Fertile Crescent, so if you get that land, that's really beneficial for you. And it is, there's more of an incentive to take someone else's arable land since it's a rare commodity in that region. So that would, in, that would lead to a, a tribal mindset where your family run this bit of land. And if you're a stranger, uh, kill them first and ask them who the hell they are and what they want later. That would be beneficial. That's something that's been floated as an explanation as to why they're like that. But yes, we have previously talked about um, Africa a lot because Africa is a big sort of divergence in um, trust, IQ, and all these other sorts of traits. I think there is a similar thing going on in the Middle East. And that sort of um, uh, geographical determinism, I guess, has, has been uh, floated as a, a sort of um, reason why it might be like that. Because we've also looked... Um, a few weeks ago about it, like rice farming, how things like that can lead into cultural structures and modes of trust. Yeah, it's just really interesting <clears throat> that the, you know, like the the average precipitation in a particular location determines so much about who we are. Like it's it seems kind of stupid, but like 
it makes sense when you think about it a bit. The idea where, you know, uh, south of the Fertile Crescent, you know, into Arabia, uh, there are these, uh, only these relatively small patches of uh, land that, you know, arable land, land that's actually useful for, um, not even just for, like, sustained, sustained agriculture, for even just for, like, keeping herd animals and stuff like that. And that, that sort of description of, like, there, there are these small areas of land and you have to be very tribal about it and maintaining it makes a lot of sense when you compare it to, uh, like, the high trust of, um, of like, Scandinavia, where you have to have, like, these very tight-knit communities, but if you don't like the people, you can always go somewhere else. Like, it, it's just a, it's an interesting contrast there. Yeah, yeah, that that is um, definitely true. I mean, I, I completely agree with you that trust plays a major role in differentiating the West from, well, the non-West, where where social trust is is very rare. Like East Asians can do it. Japan is high trust. Uh, South Korea can do it. Yep, South Korea. Um, yep. But yeah, it's like you know, everyone's like everyone knows that some parts of the world are better than other parts wealthier more prosperous safer and all of that sort of thing and everyone tries to solve it oh well they're poor they're this they're that um you know some people look to genetic explanation there's probably the minority no one says it's 100 percent genetic but genetics plays a part um uh geographical determinism is probably a bit more common than genetic determinism because you know if, you, if, you, if you're a genetic determinist, you're a, you know, a racist and all that sort of thing. Geographic determinism is a bit sort of politically safer to espouse. And I think... Um, it's a, it's like the same got, thing, though. That's like, yeah, they're not, necessarily, they're not necessarily in conflict because yeah. an organism adapts to its environment and genes are the substrate of that sort of uh, selection. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, can, it can easily be the case that if you practice rice farming, for instance, that your that genes that are better at high trust um, labor intensive processes like rice farming are better passed on. Yeah. And like, I wonder Gen- genes that select for hating anyone that's not in your family is beneficial if you're in an area where arable land is rare and someone has a lot of incentive to come and take it from you. Yeah, if you're in a constant conflict sort of situation, then being innately hostile to the outsider is really useful. Yeah, and uh, you can sort of see that, like uh, that 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 was what Islam did was it sort of turned the, the, the those um, Arab Arabic outsiders into the, the family group, and everyone else was the outsiders, and that is a, you know extremely good explanation of. Uh, why that sort of sudden population boom that I described in my part like occurred. But I, I actually do wonder how much uh, social trust is genetic. And I actually do, I am becoming more and more convinced that social trust per se uh, is, is actually not a uh, highly, um, it's like the, the, the major uh, variability, uh, variability of it, I don't think is actually genetic as far as, from from what I was saying, just like you look at the, um, you, like you look at uh, Asia is a really good example of this, where the Han Chinese are very low trust society, but everyone around them is actually you know middle of the road to high trust, and then you, you know, obviously you go to Japan, which is actually quite ethnic, uh, quite genetically disparate for a you know, for, for like the the internals of a region, and they're quite different to the Han Chinese, and they're very similar to the Koreans, and they're both quite high social trust. But they're also very similar to the Vietnamese, who aren't so high in social trust. And, and so it's like I wonder if that actually if social if, if social trust might actually be majority culture. Like you know, the I... liberals were right in this terms. <laughs> Well, um, I mean, the thing, when people start talking about genetics, they assume that if it's genetic, it is fixed. Um, Yeah, it has to be one or the other. That's stupid. Exactly. Like, I mean, if you could take, you could take the highest trust population in the world, impose like Stalinist rule on them where you have to inform on your family and there's no food. I mean, yeah, you're going to have a low trust population. So... 
I mean, it's like uh, some people are genetically able to go to the gym and get bigger than other people, but you're not like genetically at one size and you stay there. It's like your genes determine in, in what range environment can move you in one direction or another. And okay, so I've, I've given the example a few times in the show now, like uh, the, the genetics environment sort of comparison is like saying the difference between a skinny and a fat person running um, uh, how fast they could do a marathon, you know, a, a skinny person could decide just to walk it, but the fat person only has the option of walking it. Yeah. Um, it's sort of that modulating factor, but like I, I've sort of becoming a little bit more convinced that social trust, like there are other things which are obviously, you know, more predominantly genetic, like IQ, uh, but like social trust, um, I, I, I think there's a solid argument that, um, that that environment has a larger weighting factor than a larger weighting factor than genetics. And that might just be because you know, the Neolithic revolution is only 10,000 years old. Yeah. Um, and so we haven't had that time to sort of evolve that proper genetic trust, I guess you could say. And that, that, that would make a lot of sense. Whereas IQ, we've had to be, we've had to, had to problem solve for a lot longer than we've had agriculture. So. Yeah, I agree. No, it's just, it's just interesting. Uh, uh, Kathy, we haven't heard you f- uh, from you for a while. Do you have any thoughts or? Um, yeah, I mean, I think... Overall, what um, Lawrence was talking about um, is just an excellent illustration of why 6,000 years of inbreeding is not a good thing for your society. Oh, yeah. Totally well, we've only forgot. got one data point there. I forgot, right? to mention, uh, <laughs> I forgot to mention the high rates of inbreeding. And in places like Iraq, it's up to like 60% of people married yeah. to... Yeah, it's it ridiculous. First or second cousin, yeah. It's, and it's... And it's even worse than that, um, because they're because of the their you know centuries millennia long um, cousin and uh, you know uncle niece whatever marriage, uh, their cousins are more closely related than what we think of as cousins, so it's it's even more inbred than you would think of. First yeah, because you, like you have these like lines of descent forever and imagining, and you see like uh, you know often the. <laughs> often like well like you know hundreds of years ago sort of thing uh, you've got these two ancestors which are completely separate and like you've got these sort of two uh lines like you know like think a family tree just sort of of, of of these descent and they finally meet at one point and only once and that's sort of the stereotype and you know to a degree it's actually fairly accurate for a lot of europe that's not nobility um obviously there's always interaction there but um when you look at these family trees of uh of this region you know the, across the fertile crescent and into arabia you sort of see you sort of see instead of like these two separate like roots branching out that meet at one point they're almost the same one <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh it doesn't have any branches the, the this, kind yeah. of, this kind of family tree and it just it just goes to show you what this, you know, dysgenics does, and you know, I can I can imagine that you know they maybe started out on a similar um, level as Europeans, but then we kind of went one way, and then they went the other, and it's what you have. Yeah, it's just kind of like the, the whole contact of anything is you know, especially from a European things like you, but it's uh, they've done. I would say they've done almost like an impressive job of avoiding. Uh, like uh, was it Charles the Second of Spain? I always use him as a reference because his picture is hilarious. Um, but like the most heavily inbred, uh, I would like okay, he's like the best record we have of like very heavy inbreeding, and they've managed to avoid that. But I guess you could say by you know they've got this selective force there uh, yeah. because. You know, you know, uh, if they're completely pants on head retarded and they've got six fingers and all that sort of stuff, they're not going to survive. So they have to maintain this level of mediocrity, like of like this sort of not good, not bad enough to fail, but just because of the inbreed, it's always going to be sort of like a burden pushing that population down. And it's just kind of it's weird just looking at it from a outsider's perspective, and you know what what we would call like you know European morals. 
sort yeah. of perspective. They also haven't been uh, bred for um, for attractiveness because you can you can see the uh, you know the the effect of arranged marriage over um, more sort of European romantic marriage. Um, so you can see the in, in the differences of, of the different levels of attractiveness that um, these people have as well. That's an, an, another point. Yeah, well, the the attractiveness has a whole num a whole other aspect to it. Yeah, with there's no selective resi- pressure for it. That's oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah, there is, but there's just it's not as extreme as it was in Europe. Yeah, it's it's pretty uh, minor because if you're going to keep it in the family, and if your family decides um, who you're going to marry anyway, you know, you, there's there's not much uh, not much pressure to be um, you know to compete with um, other mates, potential mates. Yeah, well, uh, that's, you know, it's arranged marriages, but without, like, the sort of uh, horse trading that goes on in European yeah. societies in that regards. Yeah. Um, shall we uh, move on? Move on, because, because we're getting into two hours. Just have, can I just say one yeah. quick thing? Yeah, yeah go um, it, I've put up some links, Why Arabs Lose Wars. That's a good article. Um, Strategy Page is a site I got some information from, and a good book, if people are interested, is called the Closed Circle, an Interpretation of the Arabs by David Price Jones. It was written in 1989, so it's it's old. But um, so it's got a lot of, you know, sort of stuff talking about the Saddam regime, which is obviously not very contemporaneous now. But um, that's an excellent book. I recommend that. Yeah, I've added all those to my I've already added those to to like my set of references. So they will definitely be in the they, they'll be in the description. OK, great. All right, wonderful. And so now you can rest your voice. I would like to <laughs> and... do a lot of shutting up now. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, Kathy, why don't you um, why don't you go on about your uh, your special snowflake groups of Arabs? Right. Yes. Yeah. So um, I'm going to talk about the Yazidis mainly um, for the sake of brevity, because I had done a bit of research on the Assyrians as well. But I think I think I'll stick to the probably the most snowflakey group of all in in the Middle East. So um, the Yazidis actually aren't Arabs. Uh, they are ethnically, although there's a bit of arguments there, but ethnically they are Kurds. Um, so they've, uh, they've been long an object of fascination among Orientalists, basically because uh, of, of their kind of unique religion uh, that has been uh, uh, oftentimes... Um, called to be devil worship um and also uh there's you know they're, they're kind of unique um unique status in in, in those societies and their insul- insulation and insularity as well so um they the cultural practices are observably kurdish and almost all speak Kurd- Kurmanji, uh, which is northern kurdish with the exception of uh, some places in uh, northern iraq where arabic is spoken um, Comanji is the language of almost all the orally transmitted religious traditions of the Yazidis. Um, and the, their uh, religious origins are complex. Um, it's a very highly syncretistic religion. There's some um, Sufi influence and imagery in their religious vocabulary, especially in the, in the terminology of their esoteric literature. But all of the mytho- mythology is completely non-Islamic and their cosmogenies appear to have um, many points of similarity with ancient Iranian religions, uh, you know, Zoroastrianism and, um, and Mithraism as well. Um, early writers attempted to describe Yazidi origins, broadly speaking, in terms of Islam or Ra- Iranian or sometimes even pagan religions. Um, but it's uh, this sort of approach is oversimplistic and it's very, very syncretic um, indeed. Um, the origin of the Yazidi religion is now seen by scholars as a complex process uh, whereby the belief systems and practices of local faith had a profound influence on the religiosity of adherents of the um, Adawiya Sufi order living in the Kurdish mountains and caused it to deviate from Islamic norms relatively soon after the death of the founder of this order, um, Sheikh uh, Adib Mosayef. Um, so the history of it. Um, Adib Mosayef, bin Mosayef, who was of Umayyad, Umayyad descent, was born in uh, 1075 uh, uh, BC, uh, AD in the um, Bekaa Valley. After studying in Baghdad, um, he settled in the w- valley of Lalesh, which is about 36 miles northeast of Mosul in the early 12th century. Uh, groups who uh, venerated 
Yazid um, be, uh, bin Moawiyah and the Umayyads. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm completely destroying the pronunciation of this, but um, it's nothing I can do about that. Uh, so th- these groups, also, uh, already known as Yazidis, had been existing for some time in the area. Um, beliefs and practices, which were apparently part of an ancient uh, Persian religion, were also retained by some of the local tribes. Uh, and uh, this is not that long after the um, kind of spread of Islam in the first place. So this, um, at the time, I'm sure there were lots of uh, holdouts of the uh, the pre-Islamic traditions there. Um, so this uh, um, Sheikh Adi himself was a figure of undoubted orthodoxy, enjoyed widespread influence. He died in 1162 and his tomb at Lalesh is a focal point of Yazidi pilgrimage. Um, his name uh, passed into Yazidi oral tradition, though full knowledge of his identity was lost within the community. Yazidism grew during the period of Ataberg and Mongol rule. Um, only two generations later, led by Hassan bin Adi, the community had grown large and powerful enough to come into open conflict with the Ataberg of Mosul, who killed Hassan in 1246. At about the same uh, point, the community began to incur uh, the uh, wrath uh, of more orthodox Muslims for a successive menera- veneration um, of both Sheikh Adi and Yazid bin Muawiyah. During the 14th century, important Kurdish tribes whose sphere of influence stretched well into Turkey or, uh, are cited uh, in historical sources as Yazidi. Uh, Muslim leaders clearly perceived Yazidis as a threat. Uh, there was a significant battle in 1414 during which Sheikh Adi's tomb was raised. Um, after the, ba- uh, the Battle of Chaldaran in 1514, Yazidi influence had first remained considerable. A Yazidi was appointed emir of the Kurds by the Ottomans, and in 1530, Yazidi emirs ruled the province of Saran for a time. Um, the current family of Yazidi emirs claiming Umayyad origins replaced the descendants of Sheikh Hassan in the 16th and 17th century. However, as time passed, uh, as these things do tend to happen, conversions to Islam became increasingly common and Yazidi power declined. By the end of the Ottoman Empire, many important tribes and confederations still had sizable Yazidi sections and the dynasty of Yazidi emirs uh, remained dominant within a limited geographical area, but Yazidis had suffered enormously from religious persecution. Until 1849, when provision for their protection was made under Ottoman law, they had not had the status of people of the book. In the, uh, so, you know, they were seen as... Uh, these uh, heathens that uh, you know could be just be killed um, at random. In the 19th century, complex social and political changes, many related uh, to certain reforms, produced an environment of increasing li- religious intolerance, culminating in large-scale massacres of the Christian minorities. Um, the Yazidis, also targets of uh, militant Sunnism, suffered at the hands of Kurdish tribal leaders as well as Ottoman officials. Um, there was some cooperation, actually, between the minorities. The Yazidis of Mount Sinjar sheltered Armenians during the Armenian genocides um, in, the early 19, in the early 1900s. Um, during the 19th and early 20th century, many Yazidis fled to Georgia and Armenia. And in the second half of the 20th century, most of Turkey's Yazidis, who still lived in fear of religious persecution, emigrated to Germany. Um, and in the 1990s, many of Iraq's Yazid intelligentsia went there, uh, where they still sort of... Um, organize and play an active role in diaspora affairs. So the Yazidi heartland is in northern Iraq. Um, I'm sure a lot of our listeners will remember sort of in 2014, um, the the news items on ISIS, uh, you know, killing Yazidis around Mount Sinjar and where they went to um, to seek refuge. So this is there's a substantial community known for its conservatism on Mount Sinjar, which is uh, 80 kilometers west of uh, Mosul on the border of Syria. Uh, a collection of farming villages and small towns lies in the uh, Shaikan area near the f- uh, in the foothills northeast of Mosul. This area is adjacent to the shrine of Lalesh and contains uh, the home of the Mir and the settlements um, of uh, the Kawals, who are the reciters of the sacred text, so kind of a, a priestly class. Um, in the 20th century, um, these uh, communities struggled for religious dominance. And there's also diff- different uh, groupings of Yazidis in Syria. Uh, but these are very small and probably only about 15,000 in total. Uh, there's some Yazidis who still live in Turkey, um, you know, in, in the Kurdish areas and the um, and the trans Caucasian communities, so uh, Georgia and Armenia uh, Yazidis, which were numbered some uh, 60,000 in the early 1900s, also declined due to economic and political factors. Um, 
For example, during the 1990s, the population in Georgia decreased from some 30,000 to under 5,000, presumably due to uh, them leaving to go either um, back to, um, to Iraq or to the West, more likely to the West. Um, although numbers in Armenia have apparently remained more constant. Um, the diaspora communities have obviously re- have increased correspondingly. Some 40,000 Yazidis now live in Germany, um, mainly in the, the uh, sort of the west of Germany, in the uh, Nordrhein and Westfalen and uh, Niedersachsen. Um, or North Sa- uh, Lower Saxony. Uh, most are, are from Turkey, uh, with arrivals during the 1990s from Iraq, including some influential figures. Um, so... Yeah, so there's they're, they're kind of spread all over the place. Um, their their source is in this area around sort of northern Iraq and uh, and Syria and and Turkey. The kind of where the Kurds really are. So they're they're, they're intrinsic in that place, and they've um, they've moved around a little bit because of their um, the, you know the persecution that they received because of their their unique religion. So. Uh, the, the most interesting thing about them, obviously, is that religion. So um, contemporary Yazidism is a religion of orthopraxy. So practice in terms of careful adherence to rules governing all aspects of life is more important than the role of scriptural text, dogma and professions of personal belief. So it's kind of a, a, a quote unquote good work, good deeds rather than uh, faith uh, is the type of practice. It's two key, key uh features of Yazidism. So there's a, a preoccupation with religious purity and a belief in metempsychosis. Uh, the first um, is expressed in the system of caste, the food laws, the traditional preferences for living in Yazidi communities, and the variety of taboos governing many aspects of life. Um, the second is very crucial. Yazidis traditionally believe that the seven holy beings are periodically reincarnated in human form called a kasa. Not only does this reinforce the caste system, as the members of the dominant religious caste are the descendants of the most recent manifestations of the holy beings, uh, but it also provides a mechanism from syncretism, as figures from other traditions can be said to be earlier manifestations of the kasa. A belief in the reincarnation of lesser Yazidi souls also exists. Um, the Yazidis use the metaphor of a change of garment to describe the process, which they call Kiras Gehorin, or changing the shirt. Alongside this, Yazidi mythology also includes descriptions of heaven and hell and other traditions attempting to reconcile these ideas with the belief system of reincarnation. So in the Yazidi worldview, God created the world, which is now in the care of a heptad of seven holy beings known as the angels or Haftseh, the seven mysteries. Uh, preeminent among these is uh, Malak Taus, the peacock angel, who is equated with Satan by outsiders. So hence the um, uh, this uh, idea that the Yazidi are quote unquote devil worshippers. Um, most uh, Yazidis find this identification highly offensive. However, it is clear that Malak Taus is an ambiguous figure. Um, the uh, one of the books, the Book of Illumination, which claims to be the words of Malak Taus um, and which presumably represents Yazidi belief, states that he allocates responsibilities, blessings, and misfortunes as he sees fit, and that it is not for the race of Adam to question him. The um, the Yazidi taboo against the word Shaitan uh, and on the words containing the sound Ash and T that might to their ears recall it many may indicate some perceived connection between this figure and Malak Taus. Um, the reasons for the connection remain unclear. Although some Sufi traditions have presented Satan as a redeemed or holy figure, Shaikh Adi uh, bin Mosafa, who apparently um, was orthodox on the matter. Um, however, pre-Islamic Zoroastrian tradition indicates some link between Ariman and the peacock, and this ambiguity may predate Islam. Um, Yazidi accounts of creation, which have much in common with those of... Um, of kind of the the the, the other uh, the the other Abrahamic religions, quote unquote, uh, state that the world uh, create the world created by God was at first a pearl. It remained in this very small and enclosed state for some time before re- being remade in its current state. During the period uh, the heptad were called into existence, God made a covenant with a term and uh, sorry, God made a covenant with them and entrusted the world to them. It's been suggested um, on the evidence of pre-Zoroastrian um, Persian cosmogony and its similarity to Yazidi cosmogonies that if the Yazidi's ancestors venerated a benign demiurge who set the word in motion, the role of this figure may have been may have become ambiguous when they came into contact with Zoroastrians whose cosmogony was essentially similar, but whose demiurge was Ariman who polluted the world. Thus, Yazidism would be not a form of Zoroastrianism, but a religion possessing uh, uh, a Persian belief system akin to it. 
So um, this kind of just illustrates that they their religion is very gnostic in its um, um, in, in in kind of in in, its, in many of its beliefs. Uh, so th- th- there is this idea of a demiurge. However, in a, in the case of the Yazidis, it's a it's a benign demiurge rather than a, a malevolent, uh, as was the um, the case of the Gnostics. So, besides Malak Taus, members of the Heptad, um, who were called into existence by God at the beginning of all things, include Sheikh Adi, his companion Sheikh Hassan, and a group known as the Four Mysteries. Um, so, there's um, another interesting uh, sort of tradition uh, of the Yazidis that deviates. Um, from uh, sort of the other religions uh, of the of the region is the idea that um, they come not from you know Adam and Eve, so they're not the children of Adam and Eve. They are the children of Adam who placed his sperm in a jar, and that a child grew out of the jar, and uh, they are the descendants of this child, uh, or the the pit jarvan, um, as they as they call it. So it's the son of the jar. So that's an interesting kind of. Uh, uh, no, no girls allowed <laughs> aspect of it. <laughs> I wonder if that's got any sort of like um, commonality with the Greeks, like because the the ancient Greek myth of um, like uh, Pandora and the jar. Uh, Pandora was Pandora's present- box, yeah. Oh, it, it, it was a, it was a jar originally, but yeah, uh, the jar was uh, well, sorry, uh, Pandora was presented to the first man as basically a trap. It was like a way to ruin his life. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, actually. um, Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, I'm blanking. Uh, The guy, the god who stole fire. Prometheus. Prometheus, yes. Uh, Prometheus uh, was the creator of man. And uh, he warned the first man, I can't remember his name, not to... Stay um, away from thoughts. Yeah, stay away from thoughts. Well, not to accept any gift given, any gifts given by the gods, uh, because yeah. they were going to screw them over. And then, uh, well, Zeus took the likeness of uh, Hera and Persephone and created woman. And uh, he saw that, and you know, he uh, was seduced by the thought. But yeah, I wonder if there's sort of like a commonality there of like, oh God, that's avoid women. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's an interesting. Uh, that, 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 I mean, it's it's hard to know. There could be kind of a tangential um, a tradition that kind of deviates from uh, you know this this idea of uh, of a jar of of you know evil yeah. to this jar that this uh, of, of semen. <laughs> pure semen, yeah, I guess uh, I don't know. Well, it's I, I well thinking a little bit more about it now. I, I I think it might have to do with the just just the word jar might just sort of be like an English stand-in for a whole variety of different things. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't, th- don't necessarily think, but just, just, just the phrasing, uh, just, just the, like the explicit use of, of, of jar, um, seemed quite, uh, explicit, but like thinking, like thinking about it a little bit more, it might not like, it might just be sort of like, well, this is the closest that we have in English sort of thing. Yeah, perhaps, so, yeah. um, it's, it's a very interesting, interesting tradition that they have. It's um, it's kind of a really autistic form of um, of gnosticism, I think. Or, but again, again, one that's um, that survived rather than died off because they don't uh, discourage uh, having children, so <laughs> it's slightly more successful than than the other types, but. It's an interesting syncretism of various different um, cultures. You know, a little bit of uh, a little bit of Islam, a little bit of Zoroastrianism, a little bit of you know even faiths predating those. And um, also, they, they they kind of include everything. So they've got they've got Jesus as again one of their uh, incarnations of um, of their seven holy holies and, and things like that. So it's yeah, it's a it's a it's, it's a very I th- I think it's a fascinating it's a fascinating faith and um, well, uh, there's a lot of it going around that region. Like Islam includes Christ as one of their prophets. Yeah, yeah. It's just oh, anything goes, I guess. <laughs> in, uh, yeah. Well, in uh, it, it, it works for other people, so you know, uh, like Lawrence mentioned, it's a very common thing. Just sort of folding in other faiths and cultures as yours sort of takes over the area. Yeah. 
it's a, it's a good way to uh, silence dissent. It's like no, 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 you you were right, just just not in the just just not in the correct way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um, a, and and also there's there's some other interesting aspects. So for example, if you uh, you can never convert into Yazidism, it's an ex- it's an extremely uh, you can only be born a Yazidi, so it's uh, eth- ethnic in that sense. Um, and also, if you um, if if you then become you know convert into a different religion, Islam, Christianity, whatever, then you're not a Yazidi. Uh, you kind of lose that status. You lose that title, um, that that identity. Um, so it's a so it's a very strong ethno religious identity in that sense. So it's one is tied with the other. Um, completely, they um they have the pil- they they have pilgrimages, so like a Hajji type thing to the uh, to the site uh, called uh, of the, of Lalesh um, that I mentioned before, and they also pray to rather than you know praying to one specific uh, part area of um, of the of you know the the compass, they pray to the sun. So they pray five times a day, like Muslims, but they pray to the sun wherever it is, and at noon they pray um, in the direction of Lalesh. So that's a uh, that's an interesting um, aspect of that as well, kind of a, a parallel, I guess, uh, from that. So, so, so they, do they worship the sun, or no? They don't. They don't worship the sun as such, but they um, um, because uh, Malak, Malak Taos is kind of a solar figure. In that sense, the peacock angel, um, it's it's kind of maybe seen as a uh, as an emanation or a or an eye, if sort of a or what, what do you call like an, an like an icon or a um, an idol in that sense, a man- yeah, manifestation of him. Because the praying five times a day thing, you know, it was originally it was at five thousand times a day was how much you needed to pray in order to sort of get right with God, and then Muhammad's just like, you know, well, that that's not reasonable. <laughs> what about uh, you know? C- can you lower it? And he's, God's, uh, you know, what about five hundred times a day? Well, no, yeah, can't that, do that. That's that. A- it's one of those things with, with Semitic religions, isn't it? Whether you always try to Jew God. Yeah, it's, it's about Jewing things. God. That's like the primary thing. <laughs> it, it, that's a good point. It's very much that sort of bargaining with God, whereas uh, um, uh, the, the Western religions and the Eastern religions are just sort of like this force from on high affecting you. Whereas I guess the Semitic ones are like this, you are this force affecting the above. Uh, it's just weird. Um, so, so how do the uh, Yazidi fit in? Like, where do they fit on that spectrum? It, in in that sense, I think they, they I think they're they're well in the um, in in the kind of uh, you know border in between the um, the sort of Aryan Zoroastrian traditions and the Semitic traditions. In that sense, um, so for example, they are um, obsessed with uh, religious purity. Uh, they don't mix elements perceived to be incompatible. Um, you know, they have their caste system. They, um, uh, you know, they they banned exogamy. They uh, they have, for example, a prohibition on eating lettuce or wearing the color blue. Um, interesting. And, yeah, interesting. And yes, they have these ancient uh, Persian preoccupations to do with taboos with the bodily refuse, hair, and menstrual blood as well. Um, so it's too, too much contact with non Yazidis is, is also seen as polluting. Um, you know, they're for, for, for example, they're forbidden to share uh, cups and razors with outsiders. It's a, uh, it's they're very Jewy in that sense. I think this kind of um, extreme uh, dislike and uh, distrust and kind of uh, a, a extreme view of the other as polluting and dirty and. You know, subhuman in that sense, I guess you could. It's like say. it's rules lowering. There's always like little particulars that you need to stick to, and they don't really mean anything in of themselves, but they're attributed some uh, like like they're they're attributed a meaning by their faith and their culture. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um. So, so yes. Yeah, so, so I think that's a that's a fair um, description of the Yazidis, um, their, their religion. Um, so do, is there? Any more questions you have on that? Yeah, I, I am. I am still just kind of wondering about because they sound, like you said, they sound like a bit more middle of the road, but they definitely sound like they skew more towards the Semitic. I think um, so. I think so too. Um, uh, I think it's where they've lived and who they've interacted with. Obviously, has had a massive influence on that. 
Um, and I think from a from a religious point of view, it's definitely a more Semitic type of uh, religion um, because of, you know, this, um, especially because of this idea of these these rules and these um, and these religious castes, like, you know, the ancient uh, ancient Israelites had their specific religious caste. Um, um, so do so do they um, that's not allowed to intermarry into into the other ones. I guess that kind of also reflects the. Um, the Brahmins, so it could be a more a more generic type of uh, yeah. well, leftover I, tradition. But I, I think that ev- everyone did that. The, the difference between uh, Europe primarily and uh, East Asia as well, to a degree, was the sort of um, like moving on, evolving from that point. Yeah. And so it's not so much that we're different, but we've gotten further from that point. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, okay. and you see all of true, the. Yeah. Yeah, you see all of those uh, remnants in Christianity as well, uh, like the uh, not eating uh, not eating fish during Easter and all that all that sort of stuff. All of these, what we sort of see is like they are like arbitrary restrictions um, with cultural meaning behind it. And we've sort of we've moved from you know you read the Old Testament and the you know the, the guy who worked on the Sabbath was struck down for gathering firewood and all that sort of stuff. And we, we we've moved from that we've moved from that place to where we are now um like culturally and it's just sort of it's it's just different and it's interesting that that, that's sort of like a defining feature of europe although now that i say that and think of it um that's christianity uh they're that the the same sort of thing wasn't really there in pagan Europe, there were similar things, uh, like like the idea of uh, class uh, was. It it wasn't um, you know it, it, there was uh, transmissibility between the classes, but they that they were a recognised thing. Um, I I can't think I, of of a single. I may be wrong in this, but I can't think of a pagan tra- European pagan tradition that had this obsession with purity in that sense, and that would see certain um, bodily functions as impure. I don't remember. Like, yeah, you, you wouldn't that, have that's... women go into a different building to menstruate, for example. Yeah, that, that's kind of where I was sort of, where, uh, it's not quite where I was getting, but there's the same similar sort of thing where I was getting, there wasn't this sort of extreme of things. Like, um, I said, like, uh, in, in the Old, old Norse, uh, religion. Uh, Heimdall basically slept with three women, and th- those were the classes, you know, uh, slave, uh, free man, and noble, essentially. Uh, and and th- these were these things, and you could move between them, but like, that, that was sort of your lot in life. Whereas these Semitic uh, faiths, um, and I, I, will, I will lump Christianity in to them but Christianity also does have a lot of European pagan influence so like uh, don't rant at me please um, but I will lump Christianity in that because it seems to tend more towards it uh, where it's just sort of this idea where there is a like an arbitrary standard and um, yeah. a, lo- a lot of bodily like you said bodily function um, a lot of the way that uh, uh, like especially like the old uh, the Old Testament definitely um not mixing fibers in your clothes and not mixing uh, milk and meat and all that sort of st- dairy and meat and all that sort of stuff. It's all very, it's all very arbitrary. There's a cultural, there's a cultural meaning behind it or a religious meaning behind it, but it's just, it's arbitrary. Yeah, I think so. I think uh, arbitrary is definitely a very Semitic trait. Um, that and Jewing God, I think. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, even if you want to, okay, if you want to take the, uh, the 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 least kind way of looking at it, you know, Christianity was Christ doing like well, it was some dude doing over God in order to get a better state for everyone else, which is crappy. Uh, but I'm not even like that's a really bad way to go into it. But I know some people uh, think that way, but like. The Semitic ones are literally uh, the other Semitic ones, especially Judaism, are all about oh yeah, I'm going to outsmart God. Whereas all of the stories in the on the pagan side of things, like you look at like explicitly the uh, the prosader, 
it's the gods have done this incredible thing. Like, uh, how do I deal with it? It's it's very different. Uh, they're very different. But anyway, we we could talk for probably hours about that. So it'd probably be a good time to wrap up. Yep, sounds good. All right. Um, so next week we are discussing uh, the Semites that we have most conspicuously left out. Uh, yes. That would. It's be... gonna echo the next the next episode. Is gonna be one long echo. Yes, and then after that, we shall hopefully have a very special guest, and you'll find out then. But anyway, this has been the Darwin Digest, episode 49, where we have been discussing the Middle East, Semites, and Arabia. I'll see you next time. Bye! Bye.